welcome all members to um, this week's session of the committee. Just to inform everyone, just in relation to the use of mobile devices, um, can be used through the Wi-Fi connection, um, but all devices should be muted. And password details for those who will be in the gallery um, are on the gallery rules. So just to welcome you once again, welcome Mr. Beggs, well to the committee. Um, just this this week we will be considering the ministerial briefing, which is the first day brief which we received last week in senior packs again this week. Um, there'll be a briefing from the driver and vehicle agency, and we also then have, as requested by members, um, a departmental briefing on SR 2017-34, which is the Roads Miscellaneous Provisions 2010 Act. Um, and then we'll be looking at uh, the, the statutory legislation's yeah. consideration of the examiner of statutory rules report. Um, with regards to apologies, um, I understand that um, Raymond McCartney is, is leaving the Assembly, and at this stage there isn't any replacement, so hence that's the, the gap that we have today. Um, so pass on our best wishes to Mr McCartney. Sure, we just write a wee letter of thanks and regard to him for his contribution? Absolutely. Okay. Thank I'm you. moving then on to um, chairperson's business. Um, obviously, the committee attended a very useful event hosted by TransLink to reveal its new carbon neutral hydrogen bus last Wednesday, and we also had an opportunity to do a little bit of a tour of, of the service centre there, which was um, again very useful for us. Um, and we, a number of members were able to, you, um, to highlight a number of issues. So, is the um, committee content to schedule um, a visit to Wright Bus, who built the hydrogen bus um, into our forward work program. That was obviously come up in conversation while we were there, so yeah. to do that. Thank yeah. you. Um, committee then also uh, on the same day made a visit to the Boucher Road MOT Centre. Um, we had a chance there to speak to both staff and management about the current uh, lift situation. Again, this was a, a very useful visit. Um, particularly for all those who did int attend and will obviously inform our discussions this morning with officials. So um, again, if we can pass on our thanks then to um, our own staff here for um, arranging um, particularly the visit to the DVA at very short notice um, and also pass on our thanks to uh, other officials too for accommodating us. Draft minutes are item three and it's at page five. Um, they're the draft minutes for a meeting of the 28th of January. Are members content, or have you got any issues in relation to that? Great. Great. Thank you. Moving then on to matters arising at page 16 of your packs. Um, they're from, again, from our meeting of the 28th of January. Um, do you have any concerns or issues arising from last week's meeting? All content? Okay, great, thank you. Moving then to our correspondence, um, just draw your attention to correspondence at page 19. This is from Queen's University Belfast. They're offering a briefing on the UK withdrawal from the EU, statutory instruments and devolved competence. This correspondence has been issued to all of the statutory committees. Um, members should also be aware that the Assembly does have a, an EU exit working group. We have been actively engaged in consideration of legal and practical issues arising from um, EU exit um, for the last three years. So I'm not sure whether you want to action anything at this stage or if you wish to note it. I think, if we, I think maybe just for noting this morning and pass it on to that group that are doing the work at the minute. And then we can have a look at what the happens comes out of that really. Oh, it's already been, yeah, has been passed. Oh, it has been passed. Yeah, has. Mr. Beggs? Uh, again, I, it seems to be a, a generic letter to uh, all yeah, committees. Um, if we come up across an issue where we think it might be relevant, I think yeah, we should yes. just note it at this stage, mm -hmm. but it might be useful in the future. Mr. Yeah, through the chair, I mean, Chair, the obviously responsible for our committee would say the initial response in relation to the infrastructure, how that impacts. I mean, I take it that would feed into the, the main body anyway. If we have any other ideas to suggest any questions or whatever they need to do, and we do and just have feedback a, to us, yeah? We do have a briefing from officials on okay. Brexit from, in relation, uh, in relation issues, to infrastructure that's... next week, so there may be issues that you may mm, want to raise well. and we okay. expect to that with them. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, page 26, we have correspondence from the Investment Strategy in Northern Ireland. 
providing a copy of its investment activity report, which collates up-to-date information on the status of government projects. I do understand this comes in colour. So <laughs> whenever we do, whenever we receive, um, whenever we start receiving these by um, electronic device, will probably be more useful to us. But uh, if members are content at this stage to, to, to note the correspondence. But just one question, Chair. Uh, I know, uh, and certainly in my own, in, in Banbridge, on the carriageway, that there was uh, an offer of European funding. So I would want to know how many of the projects have had commitments made in, uh, from Europe and uh, if those commitments will still be honoured. And if not, will the British government then honour them separately, as they have done uh, with the, the cap provisions? So we, can, we can ask that question. Content to note this correspondence. Okay, thank you. The correspondence then from a member of the public at page 44 regarding coastal roads, heavy traffic, tourism, and greenways. Um, this is obviously specific to the area in and around Warren Point. Um, if, you, if you're content that maybe we refer to this to the local, um, refer them to the local MLA, but the committee will be visiting Warren Point um, Port in, in the future. I'm not sure how, how near future that will be, but we will be planning to go there at some stage. So maybe we might want to revisit that again ourselves on, on that visit. Sure, just an overview and the overall issue. I mean, we, we could we'd probably receive a number of local issues that come. To, I mean, and I, I don't mean who's in the MLA or not. The reason why they send them through this process is to send them to the Assembly. Um, could we consider maybe send them on to the Minister's Department, either or both? I mean, I don't mean. I mean, I, I can see us now over the next two years in general, we, we will receive a lot of individual issues, and I think in some of the last committees we referred them, we sent them on to the Department. It depends on whether we want to be encouraging ourselves to be the post office here, but either. No, 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 one hundred percent. I mean, so and that's we, we why could, we could be burdened with a lot of correspondence. <laughs> this also was the committee protocol on yeah. the correspondence and deciding what you have to do with it. And bear in mind, GDPR now, we can't send this on to the department right, okay. anymore. But, but, but we used to, to in the past. We used to send them on. Can't, right, can't, can't do that. Okay. Department, we have to write back to this individual and ask them for permission to send it on to the department. Right. The only alternative then is. Okay, because we used to send them on the department. Yeah, but then obviously the rules have changed in the interim. Yeah, no, that's, that's fine. That's okay. That's, the data. At least that's, that's the explanation. Okay. okay. Thank Content? you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, there's no reason why we can't pick this up again. Obviously, whenever yeah. we were in that particular area where we yeah, no, some of the yeah. issues as well. So. Um, moving then to page 46, which is correspondence from the Community Transport Association UK um, requesting to brief the committee. Are members content? that we um, ask them to come to speak to us and we schedule that into our forward work programme. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Great. Moving then to tabled items at page three, which is an invitation from the Institute for Government to members and to staff to a briefing on Brexit and the Ireland, Northern Ireland Protocol. And that's today and tomorrow. Um, so if members, this will have You've already received this in your own personal mail, so if you're content at this stage, just to note the invitation. Mm -hmm. okay. So move on then to item six, which is our ministerial briefing, and you'll find your first day briefing there at page 47. Also remind members that Hans Sart will be recording um, this session. Um, we've tabled at page nine an update from the Minister on DVA MOT centres as of the 3rd of February. At page five, we've correspondence from the Minister notifying the Committee of her intention to bring forward legislation to simplify the regulation of electric bikes. And at page seven, we have a press release from the Minister regarding the regulation of electric bikes. Um, just welcome, Minister, to the committee, along with um, Katrina Godfrey, Permanent Secretary. Both very welcome, and obviously no stranger to committees either. Um, although I suppose it's been a little bit of time since you've been before us. Absolutely. Um, obviously, Minister, I, you may want to make an, an opening statement. Very mindful of the fact that you are just new to post, and you've probably been thrown into the deep end and had to face <laughs> a crisis, which certainly you didn't predict. Um, conscious, maybe perhaps. Worried in some respects that you maybe hadn't received full information from officials in advance of this, and I suppose we sort of begs the question: Are the other other areas that weren't, um, maybe you, you or other colleagues maybe weren't fully briefed from officials either? But we are where we are, 
Um, but you're very welcome to the committee, and if you'd like to make an opening statement, and then members will follow up with questions. Okay. Um, thank you, Chair. And um, if, with your indulgence, uh, what I was just going to do was to um, set out uh, the scene. Um, set out some of the significant challenges that I've inherited and then um, outline my priorities and my direction of travel over the next two years. Um, I have to say I really am delighted to be taking on the infrastructure portfolio despite the baptism of fire the first few weeks because it really is a portfolio that impacts on people's daily lives. Um, and it's so important to our communities and our environment and our economy. Uh, I want to thank the committee uh, for its diligence and speed in progressing the SRs as well. I know that was quite a lot of work and the committee got through it very quickly, so to put on record my thanks for that. Uh, and I do want to say that I genuinely really want to work well with the committee. I want to stress that I want to be constructive. Um, the five parties that make up the executive have a monumental job to do in the two years ahead and I believe the partnership is key to progress and committees have a very important role to play in terms of scrutiny, uh, ensuring good governance and democratic accountability. But I'm also very keen to learn and hear about the committee's ideas and proposals on solutions that we can work on together as we try to address some of the key challenges facing us. Um, I, I am committed to improving the infrastructure because I want to help communities and I want to make people's lives better with the funding made available to me. Having a modern and sustainable water drainage and transport infrastructure is an essential enabler to growing our economy and improving well-being for all. It is a key enabler in ensuring regionally balanced growth, in improving connectivity and it is central to the delivery of the Executive's programme for government commitments. I'm going to now turn to some of the issues and the challenges uh, facing the department. Um, and I want to set out the scene factually in terms of the financial climate within which the department has to operate. I have inherited a very challenging financial position for many reasons beyond ministerial uh, control. The central resource issue for the department remains a recurring structural deficit arising from the cut to the department's resource budget evident in 2015-16. The structural deficit has resulted in significant reductions to opening budgets, sustained only through in-year monitoring uh, of some between 19 million to 34 million in the 2015-2019 period. The provision of public transport was sustained only by Translink's reliance on <coughs> reserves, which have reduced significantly since 2015, to the extent that working capital is currently below an independently assessed minimum threshold. For TransLink to continue to provide public transport at a deficit will have a dangerous impact on the company's ability to trade and run its working capital to a more precarious position going, going into 2021. Roads maintenance has also suffered from inadequate baseline funding, resulting in a skeleton maintenance service, half the number of grass cutting and gully emptying operations and a much reduced pothole repairs. Winter service and full year street light repairs have also um, been subject to significant funding cuts. It has not been possible to fund NI Water to the levels recommended by the regulator and the current level of service has only been possible with increased efficiency and benign levels of inflation over the last number of years. The Northern Ireland block funding from Treasury has failed to keep up with inflation and so all departments, including the Department for Infrastructure, have had to absorb inflationary pressures with flat baselines rolling forward from one year to the next. And this has had the effect that unfunded pay awards and price inflation, they have eroded the purchasing power of, resource, of my resource budget significantly. So as a result of all of this, it means that we've had disproportionate budget cuts and they've had to be made across areas of discretionary expenditure, but nonetheless very important areas. Roads, water and transport infrastructure maintenance and street light repairs. And I know that these are issues of huge concerns to members and to uh, the public right across Northern Ireland, so I'm happy to delve into some of the detail uh, during the question and answer session. My department has identified resource pressures of 53 million 67 million, then moving up to 79 million for the 2021 to 2022 23 period. And there has also been an over reliance on in year monitoring to mitigate my department's pressures, and this is just not sustainable. The Department of Finance has this year sought and been granted Treasury approval to switch 
130 million from the Northern Ireland Bloc capital budgets to supplement the resource budget shortfall. This amount has increased from the 2018-19 switch, which was 100 million. This trend looks set to continue, and it's unsustainable as it funds recurrent spending from non-recurrent funding. Non-recurrent confidence in supply funding has helped supplement inadequate budgets over the past two years, but this too is ending. It is therefore imperative that the UK Government steps up to its responsibilities and commits the necessary funding required for the delivery of the New Decade New Approach Agreement. Brexit will also present significant funding challenges, uh, among many other challenges. It is widely accepted that my department has for many years actively pursued European Union funding to support the delivery of many transport and water related projects across the north. Our success in doing this has been exceptional, and I do want to put on record my thanks to the officials who have been involved. In headline terms, we have secured over £130 million of EU support through seven different EU programmes in just over 10 years. This funding represents around one third of the total capital investment of £384 million in a wide range of road, rail, water, environmental, and clean transport projects. It is self-evident that without recourse to alternative or substitute funding streams, my department will face significant challenges in terms of co-financing major infrastructure projects in the post-European Union environment. That said, I have recently approved the submission of an application for funding under the EU's Connecting Europe facility. This application relates to the undertaking of enabling works for the Belfast Transport Hub and would, if supported, provide some £6 million of co-financing for the project. Clearly, the conditions for approval are much less favourable than before, but nonetheless, I am committed to exploring all opportunities that could bring additional funding to my department, and this includes examining ways in which proposed domestic funds, such as the Shared Prosperity Fund, can be optimised for the benefit of all infrastructure service users in the future. Moving forward, I have asked my officials to continue discussions with counterparts both here and in the UK to ensure that no stone is left unturned in exploring options that are available to me. My officials have and continue to feed into the Department for Finance-led work streams that lead directly to the Treasury. And I myself have taken up membership of the Executive's uh, Brexit subcommittee. And through this and other channels, I intend to continue to press a case for prioritisation and funding of infrastructure-related projects that support social and economic development. My department is continuing to engage heavily in the development of the 2020-27 Peace Plus programme, and officials have been in active discussions with Department of Finance colleagues, SEUPB, and colleagues from the Department for Transport, Tourism and Sport. As currently envisaged, we would expect Peace Plus to offer opportunities for our participation. As a programme, it is basically an amalgam of the previous Peace and Interreg programmes, and we would expect it to offer opportunities for territorially focused infrastructure, so water, transport and environmentally friendly projects to be supported. It is clear, however, that Peace Plus is highly unlikely to offer support for the largest scale infrastructure projects, especially those that the European Commission has identified as CEF priority projects for the region. So we're talking the Belfast Hub, York Street Interchange, and the Newry Southern Relief Road. So while Peace Plus is very much to be welcomed, it cannot realistically be viewed as being a sufficient substitute. It is perhaps opportune to make the point that not all EU funding awards are received directly by the Department, which makes the application. There are block implications that need to be considered. For example, the Connecting Europe facility funding is receded at block level, and normal practice would be that it is accrued back from the Department of Finance. And clearly, we need to understand how any negotiated arrangements relating to substitute funds may impact on the overall block, and I will encourage a full examination of this as we move through the implementation phase. Members will be glad to know I now intend to move on to the more positive side of the picture, hopefully, to talk about my priorities um, and the direction of travel and the vision and the aspirations uh, that I have. I am determined to approach this role recognising that infrastructure isn't an end in itself, it's rather a means to an end. So it's about what my department can do to connect people and to connect them to opportunities because it's about people, communities, and the economy and the environment. And I believe that as a minister, working with executive colleagues and with this committee, we can actually make a real impact and a positive difference to people's lives. So I might give just a few examples. 
Water and sewage infrastructure is key to unlocking potential growth and to delivering on the programme for government. And it's essential if we want to create jobs, build more social and affordable homes and, and grow our economy. In transport terms, the, executive, the executive's flagship schemes, the A5, A6 and the Belfast Transport Hub, along with the York Street Interchange and Narrow Water Bridge schemes, are front and centre in the new decade, new approach agreements. And I want to progress as much as possible those projects in my two-year tenure. I'm also conscious of the issue of regional imbalance, uh, and I want to play my part in tackling that. I point to the A5, the A6, but there are also opportunities for our public transport network as well, and that feeds very much into the need for greater connectivity north and south, and I welcome the commitment to that in the new decade, new approach as well. My department also has an important role to play in how we address the climate emergency. I will focus on greener infrastructure and greater sustainable transport that connects communities. So I will be promoting public transport and encouraging more of us to make our journeys by walking and cycling. <clears throat> to this end, as you referenced, Chair, I announced yesterday my intention to introduce legislation to simplify the use of e-bikes here, specifically to ensure users will not have to register and license them before use, while the rider would also be exempt from holding a valid or full driving license. I fully appreciate that I must formally seek the views of the Committee and the Assembly to this proposal, which falls under the Assembly Affirmative Resolution Procedure, and I will ensure that my officials provide the necessary documents for the Committee's scrutiny so that you can progress this and we can progress it together as quickly as possible. I am also keen to promote the Active School Travel Programme to encourage more children to walk and cycle to school, and my department co-funds this programme along with the Public Health Agency. I'm sure, like many members, I was shocked to, to learn of the number of primary school children who live less than one mile from school, but yet are making that journey via car. So I think there's a lot that we can do around that as well. Safety on our roads is a concern for me. And again, I was shocked at this significant increase in drink driving detections over the Christmas period just past. I intend to look closely at current policy and proposals for change in the coming weeks in respect of both drink and drug driving. And this work will, identify, will include identifying best practice elsewhere across these islands. And I've already issued uh, an invitation to meet with the Chief Constable uh, as a key partner in moving that forward. I also recognise the important role that the taxi industry plays within Northern Ireland, and I am aware of the concerns that they have raised. I intend to consider all of the issues relating to the current taxi regime in greater detail in coming weeks. As I've said before, we have significant challenges, uh, and if we were approaching this with the glass half full, you know, we could get very down about the financial situation. But I do believe that we have a real opportunity and we could make a big difference in the la the, these two years that are remaining. While there are significant challenges, I do have a lot of ambition uh, and I do have an appetite for change. And there are things that we can do that don't cost huge sums of money but can make a real difference in, in people's lives. So going forward, I want to work as positively with the committee as I can, uh, to say that my officials are open to meet with you any time uh, and that I'm happy to come to the committee at any time to engage with you on any issues. Um, perhaps it might be helpful for me to give an update in the MOT situation, but I'm at the discretion of the chair. Maybe you just want to leave that to questions. If you're content, we'll, we'll take that through questions. Okay. okay so, um, obviously, that you've referenced the MOT centres, and it would be remiss of the committee not to ask you questions while you're, you're here. Sure. And I appreciate very much that you have commissioned two reviews, and it'll take some time for, for that information then to, to come to you. But I suppose the most important issue for the general public is when they're going to actually get their MOT is, um, carried out. Yeah. And obviously, while I understand additional <coughs> lifts are now in place, and that's, and that's very welcome because it'll, it'll move um, through the backlog which has been created over the last couple of weeks, when do you anticipate that the MOT centres will become fully operational? At this moment in time, I can't give the committee uh, a date. Uh, I have appointed as one of the two independent reviews uh, an engineering expert company. Uh, they are currently on site assessing, and they have been tasked with providing to me independent expert advice on business recovery. That will include in, uh, contingency arrangements in the here and now to maximise capacity, but also the steps that are required to get our MOT centres back fully and safely operable uh, as quickly as possible. But uh, I am not and I would not speculate or uh, in any way leave the committee to uh, a position where I can't stand over it. So at this moment in time, I cannot give a date as to when we will have the MOT centres fully and safely operable. 
And at this stage, has any decision been taken in relation to the purchase of new lifts? Because obviously there will be a procurement process which will have to be taken place, which again will extend the time um, before the new lifts can be installed. So has there been a decision taken around that at all? So what I have asked for is I have instructed for independent assessments uh, of all of the lifts so that we can ascertain which can be repaired. Uh, but I have asked officials to prepare a sub for me on the purchase uh, of equipment, including a range of options, and the expert uh, review will feed into this. So it's really around repair, it's around hiring, if it's a possibility, and also the purchase of equipment. So the wheels are in motion in terms of putting all of the options out there and assessing the best way of going forward. Okay, I mean, there's, there's clearly a capacity issue in relation to this anyway, because yeah. we've seen uh, a cyclical sense where there has been backlogs of MOTs, and that has been created by the fact that we have far more cars on the road than we ever had before, which is obviously a piece of work which you need to do in relation to trying to change people's mindsets about using their cars in the first place. But again, that's, that's a different challenge. But there's a backlog that's been created, but we now have cars on the road which are in much better condition than they ever were. They've got much longer um, guarantees from um, the manufacturers, but yet we're still testing them after four years, every single year after that. Yes. Have you given any consideration to how that you might like to review that um, so that the regularity of MOTs is not just as frequent? I have, Chair. Um, in terms of the, the steps that I've kind of put in place, so um, the the cars who have had their DVA uh, appointments cancelled will be automatically issued with a temporary uh, exemption certificate for the four months. Um, I'm now moving to extend uh, temporary exemption certificates to three-year-old vans, uh, like good vehicles, and, and you and I had a separate conversation about that, and thank you for that. Um, but I have looked um, at what I can possibly do within the current legislation, so I can do that within the current legislation. Where things become more challenging is when we look to the four-year-old vehicles uh, and also moving the MOT from, say, every year to every two years. So what I have asked for is for legal advice on that, um, and DSO is currently preparing uh, legal advice which will come to me in terms of making a decision. But in terms of moving the MOT from annually to biannually, it is certainly something that I have requested information and legal advice on and I'm actively considering. Okay, and do you have a, a time scale for when that may come to you? And when um, I've requested a meeting with DSO either this afternoon or tomorrow morning, so I'm just waiting on confirmation of when they can appear. Okay, uh, there was another issue which I, I'd written to you about in relation to um, the exemption for 40-year-old cars. Yes. Um, obviously, that exemption exists in the rest of the United Kingdom, but it's not in, in Northern Ireland in a consultation. Yeah. I know was carried out during um, the time when this place wasn't meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just wondering when we may see parity with regards to that. Uh, so, uh, as, as you say, there was a consultation carried out and the majority of responses were supportive. Uh, of bringing it into line. So what I've asked officials to do is to provide me with a submission uh, with the consultation responses and the views so that I can make a decision on it. And it's a decision I think that we can move to quite quickly. I think what this situation with the MOT centres has brought to my uh, attention is that we need to have a review of the entire system, I think. Um, I'm very conscious that my job is, first of all, to ensure the safety of DVA staff and customers. Then it's to do what I can to minimise the disruption to motorists. It's to then get business recovery back as soon as possible. It's to also understand what happened here, why it happened, put in steps that you know are required to ensure it doesn't happen again. But I think inevitably this leads us to needing to take a look at the entire system uh, and how it operates and the legislation around that. And that's something you know that is on my radar, something that I'm not able to do at this present moment in time because we just sequentially have to work through things. But I want to assure the committee that my focus here is not just on firefighting and getting over this crisis. It's about having to take a look at the entire system and the service. I'm very mindful that um, the MOT situation perhaps has been a distraction from the rest of the issues that are, that are, are in your yeah. department. Um, and another pressing issue, I suppose, is in relation to TransLink, and, and you mentioned that in, in your opening comments. And I suppose this really is another crisis which is heading down, down the tracks uh, and really does need to be averted. Obviously, your department was unsuccessful in Jan January monitoring round. Um, and I suppose we're going to be presented with a budget by the end of this month. And I suppose really what I want to hear from you, or what assurances perhaps that you've been given um, from finance, that we will be in a situation where TransLink will not go 
to insolvency? Well, I actually have a bilateral, an eminent bilateral with Minister Murphy uh, to discuss the uh, financial challenges facing the department. Um, TransLink will feature very heavily in that, as will uh, the situation facing Northern Ireland Water and our wastewater infrastructure. Uh, in actual fact, I am also due to present to executive colleagues next week, uh, and these two issues will very much feature in my presentation. Uh, the challenges are huge, and we have to do something. It is not just an issue uh, for TransLink, it is an actual issue for the sustainability of our public transport network. It is that critical. And so the solution lies in a collective response from the executive. Um, so I will be pushing that issue with Minister Murphy at our bilateral, and we will be very much pressing the issue with executive colleagues when I present to them next week. Okay, and have you had conversations in advance of that with him? Uh, the only, well, the only uh, engagement really was the January monitoring round bid, where the department made a very clear bid on behalf of Transic. We weren't successful in that, but I'm hoping for a more positive uh, outcome from the bilateral uh, and in the budget that's <coughs> forthcoming in March. Okay, thank you. Mr. Hilditch. Thank you, Chair, and morning, Minister. Morning. Very, very welcome. Thank you. Uh, I would like to look at a couple of the. Uh, capital projects and you did indicate that over a few years now about what 220 million has been taken out of capital and put to resource and we understand your words about the European bid there of six million. But together with that information, the York Street interchange and the transport hub, now we know the transport hub has got plan information and things must be moving on there fairly fairly well. But where are we situated as a department in relation to trying to progress these uh, to do two projects in particular? Because it does impact on people's daily lives, as you indicated. Yeah, uh, uh, the transport hub is, is, is slightly different, um, but in terms of the York Street interchange, obviously uh, there was a procurement process has been challenged, so we now have to commence uh, a new procurement project or process, which will elongate um, the process there. But I, I'm clear that the York Street interchange uh, it is a flagship project. It is commitment of five parties. It is specifically referenced in the new decade, new approach. So I will be doing what I can to try to progress that forward. Um, in terms of the transport uh, hub, um, well, it's part of the city deal, isn't it? The city deal. It's a flag. It's an executive flagship. Yeah. Yeah, it's an executive uh -huh. flagship yeah. as well within the city deal. So mm -hmm. I understand how it is a catalyst for change. And if I'm serious mm -hmm. about saying to people that I want to encourage people out of cars and into public transport, then we have to be investing in our public transport. We have to be investing in transport hubs. So for me, as well as being executive flagship projects, they're key in terms of me trying to tackle my priorities as minister. On, on York Street interchange, then, there obviously was was difficulties, maybe legally or whatever way. Uh, I take it we've learnt the lessons from that, and moving forward, do we, will not reoccur again. Yes, I, I would hope. I mean, we do have an issue around kind of legal challenges, and you know the amount and the impact that they have on projects, and everyone has the right to <coughs> pursue a legal challenge. But yes, I've asked officials to make sure that going forward, you know, we try to make whatever the process is and whatever the issue, the process should be as robust as possible to make sure that we're making the right decisions in the absolute right way. Yeah, thank you. And just uh, finally. Community confidence uh, in the department and that would relate more to your street lighting pothole situation yes. and how people feel safe in their homes, particularly elderly folk in that. Yeah. Uh, you indicated that it's been operating on a skeleton budget. How, how do you plan to take that forward, considering the financial climate? Yeah, uh, um, you're absolutely right. Um, street lighting uh, and our potholes uh, are absolutely key to public confidence and public safety. Um, I have made the, the argument to some executive colleagues, and I will be making the point again when I meet with Minister Murphy in particular, that if we want to send a message to residents and communities that having an executive back makes a difference, then they need to be able to see that in a very tangible way. And yes, we have a responsibility to be strategic and transformative, and that requires kind of a long-term approach. But I honestly believe that in the two areas of streetlights and potholes, if we were to see a physical improvement on people's doorsteps, it would be signalling to them that actually having an executive back makes a difference. The situation you know, has been very, very challenging in terms of the budget. If we take the street lighting, for example, the annual budget for repair is $3.2 million, and the current budget is $1 million. So there's a significant shortfall there, and as a result, we have seen it all in our constituencies. There's been a severe restriction in terms of the street light and repair service. And previously, there would have been external contractors supplementing the work. The reality now is that our street light and repair team is a team of five full-time and three part-time workers. 
servicing the whole of Northern Ireland. Uh, we have over 12,000 outages and we have 2,000 non-outage defects and the cost to clear the backlog of repairs is £710,000. Um, now, the Department has been engaging in the LED replacement scheme and that does make savings maintenance-wise and also for the environment. That's good. 75,000 have been repaired, but we still have 213,000 uh, remaining to be replaced. Um, so it is an area that I want to try to uh, address. Um, again, we had made a bid in the January morning round. We've got some money, um, but it's capital. Mm -hmm. It's not resource, so I can't use it for repair. So I'm looking to see how I can best use it for the replacement of LED. But for me, this is, it is, is a priority area. Um, for the reasons that I have outlined. Potholes did the same. We've had an independent Barton review in 2018 that said that annually we need 143 million just to keep things, maintain them to an acceptable standard. The current capital and resource budget is 104 million. So we're in the crazy situation where we're doing the patchworking, which actually works out four times more costly. So there, these are two areas that I think we need to do more on. And I really want to have a very positive conversation with uh, Minister Murphy about that, but I'm also conscious that even within the very significant constraints that I have in my budget, it's an area that we need to do more in. Yeah, on the potholes, then, is, it, is it department subject of uh, uh, claims being made by Yeah, public? so that's the other it's, side of it. The balance there, you know? The liability, <coughs> then, uh, in terms of uh, people making claim in terms of their vehicles. Um, so that's why, you know, and the situation just continues to deteriorate. And in terms of the street lighting, for example, the department has put in a triaging system, so the highest priority, you know, gets gets repaired. But we're now in a situation because the, the underfunding has been so prolific over so many years that more and more are falling into the high priority, high risk category. So we're now in a stage where we really have to do something uh, substantial about this. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Skimmons. Uh, and thank you, Minister, and thank you for your briefing this morning. It's very helpful. It's just a couple of things, I suppose, and I'm being a wee bit parochial because they're probably more related to my own area. Sure. But um, so, just firstly, in terms of the A1 um, scheme, um, obviously, it's probably one of the most dangerous roads in the north. Um, so it's really just to see where that is in terms of phase two. Yeah. Um, so obviously, um, uh, the A1 uh, is subject to the public inquiry very shortly. Yeah. Um, I look at the A1 and I see it as falling across uh, a number of my priorities, uh, absolutely around road safety. You know, the, the tragic number of lives that have been lost in that road. And I want to pay tribute to those who have suffered a loss, in particular in our campaigning on the safety issue with a number of you as members. Uh, the second issue is around connecting communities. Uh, I think it's very important in that aspect and also around kind of the economic corridor between Belfast and Dublin that's referenced in the new decade and new approach. So obviously I have to let processes um, follow uh, due process, but what I want to say is that I recognise the importance uh, of the A1 for at least those three uh, important priority areas and I am looking at it very, very closely. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, and just as uh, you mentioned as well the Southern Relief Road for, for Newry there. We've been strongly lobbying, and I'm sure some of your colleagues in, in my area as well have been in relation to um, the Southern Relief Road either being higher or um, a lifting bridge, because I suppose one of the key issues for a lot of people, particularly in Newry, is that it will completely close down yeah. the Albert Basin, which is a huge tourism um, uh, area. So. And we, all, as you probably will know, within our council, they're they're in the process of developing the Albert Basin Park, and there's there's a lot of work going on there to to uh, develop tourism for for Newry City and the surrounding areas. So, you know, we're very um, mindful that that by completely closing that down and, and allowing not only um, we've talked about tall ships, but not only tall ships, but the, the yachts and things that are currently using um, the Albert Basin. So it's just to see where the department are on that. Um, you know, I think. In the past, the department have indicated that it would be up to council. I don't feel that that would be the case to to pay for a lifting bridge, and that they're they're proceeding with a fixed bridge. And um, so it's just to get a wee bit more information. Oh, I, I, look, I'm I'm always open to looking at, at all options. And um, yeah. what I want to do is, I've said to officials, uh, you know, I want detailed briefings and all of these things. But I also think it's important for me as a minister to go down to have an absolute yeah. look for myself, to engage with local communities and local reps, so that I can get a fuller picture 
of you know maximizing the benefits of all of these projects so i am keen to get down onto the site myself and to have a, have a look and to engage with uh, members of the local community uh, local councillors mlas and so forth so that i do have a very rounded picture uh, in terms of decisions going forward so i'd be up for doing that i think they'll be they'll be pleased to hear that we have just recently met with some of the groups there as well so um, i suppose in, in light of that as well and um, the narrow water bridge as we mentioned as well so in terms of it um, it's delighted to see that it's kind of back front and foremost on the agenda, particularly with the new deck and new, new approach. So where are we at with that or what's the next steps? Yeah. So uh, as you say, it's referenced in the new deck and new approach. Uh, it's a project that I see you know, a lot of benefits to in terms of connecting communities, promoting tourism and also protecting our natural environment. Um, what I would like to do is I've asked officials to kind of do a revision of the business case. So I'm making an information coming forward. Um, and also we have an election in the south that has had a knock-on effect in terms of north-south ministerial uh, council meetings and also engagement uh, at ministerial level so it's certainly something and it's a project that i want to pick up with counterparts in the south uh, as soon as i can that's grand and i suppose it's important for both of those you know we've said that they can't be mutually they they're not mutually exclusive, no, yes. so it's important to get them right. We have only one chance to do it. My last point, Justin, you'd be glad to hear, it's just in relation to um, the, the stuff around NI Water and the, and the water infrastructure. A lot of it seems to be quite Belfast-centric, and I know in our council last week, we the, the councillors there had a presentation from NI Water, and one of the issues that was raised in relation to the current infrastructure, particularly for Newry, a lot of the, the, the infrastructure in other areas is underused, whereas Newry is probably at full capacity and we have huge issues with garden flooding yeah. um, in the centre of Newry. So, you know, will there be any scope to look at investment into that? Because I know one of the issues that has come up um, in recent times is in terms of uh, future development in the centre of Newry yeah. and the, the flood risk is, is going to hinder that. Um, so it was just to, to ensure that that is, that is a priority as well, because yeah. it's very, very important. Yeah, and I fully take that on board. Yes, there's a Living With Water project, which has a Belfast focus, but I'm very conscious, and when I've been engaging with executive colleagues and others, that I, I recognise that there is an issue there, but there's also a wider issue that so many places are at maximum capacity or at near capacity across Northern Ireland. Um, so there's the 2.5 billion figure for the next two price controls area, which is not just Belfast centric. Mm -hmm. I think we need to do that, but it's just key. If we are serious about growing our economy and if we're serious about building homes, then we have to address the wastewater uh, infrastructure problem. Um, and we have to do that, from my perspective as well, if we're serious about tackling regional imbal imbalance, then we have to take a needs based approach when we're looking across all of the areas uh, right across the north. So just to reassure the member that I'm very conscious that I've said it before in an interview, you know, um, the world does not reside in Belfast, even though I, you know, yeah. you know, I'm from Belfast. I'm, I do this in jest, but I am conscious mm -hmm. that the Belfast has an importance, Derry has an importance, but there's a lot of communities and there's a lot of opportunities that we're not maximising right across the north that I want to play my part in utilising. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ms. Kelly. Thank you, Chair, and I thank the Minister for her comprehensive uh, presentation. I'm sure she knows that our former colleague, our late colleague, PJ Bradley, would be delighted that Narrowwater Bridge, because he campaigned over so many years and was a, a voice in the wilderness uh, for, for a very long time in relation to it. Um, could I ask, in relation to the um, water and sewage and the um, uh, commitments within New Decade New Approach around uh, the uh, uh, ca the categorisation of NIW in terms of how is able to draw funding and whether or not there's any progress or any discussions ongoing in relation to that? Yeah, so within the new decade, new approach, there is a commitment to wastewater infrastructure. There's a specific commitment to the Living with Water programme. Um, and that's why it said it's imperative for the British government to live up to its responsibilities in terms of, you know, we, we see terminology in the new decade, new approach is turbocharging infrastructure. Well, you cannot turbocharge if you do not significantly invest. Um, and so, you know, I'll be doing what I can with Minister uh, Murphy and others to see that commitment realised in terms of, of financial backing from the British government. Uh, in terms of the uh, uh, structure of Northern Ireland water, that's not referenced in the new decade, new approach. Um, but certainly, I think if we're serious at trying to get to grips with 
the significant funding shortfall, then we have to look at a range of options. And I know that when I have the presentation with executive colleagues, it's a conversation I'm sure that, we, that will be had. Uh, but at this stage, there is no decision uh, on it. Mm. Uh, but we do have to look creatively uh, at how we address this very pressing problem. Uh, and really on the subject of water, uh, there's no strategy, as I understand it, for Loch Ness, and it is the main source of drinking water for most, if not all, of Belfast. So I wonder, uh, Minister, would you turn your attention at some stage uh, to uh, a, a strategy for Loch Ness? Because it is an underused tourism potential. It has huge... Uh, it's a, a, a designated site to her, uh, under European directives, not only the lock itself, but uh, the SSI around it. And uh, it is something which I had written to the department before the re-establishment of the assembly, but uh, didn't see any urgency at all within the department in relation to it. Okay, well, it's something that I, I'll take away and look at, and I'm sure if I don't, the member <laughs> I'll, I'll make sure that it do. <laughs> and on this, so just continuing to turn the subject of water, the, uh, uh, I've written to you just recently, within the last couple of days, around uh, a draft policy around a uh, reservoir designation, which is happening around Lurgan Park Lake, which is actually stopping uh, the, the build of so, not only social housing, but the further development of of that area mm -hmm. and uh, it is a matter of huge concern and we have specialists in the area who uh, dispute uh, the, uh, the claim and the, the categorisation again by the department in relation to that. So I wonder would you uh, look further at that and uh, I know that I'll be meeting you soon and would hope that that will be on our agenda because we are due to lose uh, some money from some of our social housing uh, partners in relation to what uh, is uh, are, are much needed in, in that area in terms of social housing and, and there's very little land that we have a developer willing to work with the housing association uh, well, I, I can assure the member it's actually an issue that I'm live to at the moment. Um, there is an issue of transfer of functions in terms of the Reservoirs Act that currently sits with DERA that should be across with DFI and we're actually working up a, a process for, for seeing that transfer of functions move across. Um, the department has carried out a, an audit of, of reservoirs and we're proactively engaging with management and ownership of the reservoirs to address some of those issues. So it is something that the department is active on but I do recognise that it does have planning implications for the very reasons that you point out. So it is an issue that I'm aware of and I'm waiting on further detail, but it's something that we're proactively pursuing. Um, sorry, I just might finish then on, uh, I know you inherited uh, serious um, matters within the MOT as an understatement, but there were other reports within the Department of Infrastructure from the Public Audit Committee. You know, and I think you deck and your approach suggests to me that there ought to be accountability across departments and I just wonder how uh, effective or how that's going to be resolved and will take an executive approach because it will take substantive changes within the civil service itself. It will, uh, and there'll be the publication of the RHI report, which will have uh, implications and ramifications for, for all government departments and ministers and so forth. Um, I actually... Uh, um, want to meet with the auditor myself to discuss, as you say, those reports predated my time, um, but I am keen to sit down with the auditor to better understand uh, the situation and what we need to do going forward, um, because there are genuinely issues there uh, that need to be addressed and we need to learn from uh, going forward. Uh, but I think Minister of the Public will also want to hear that uh, people are held to account in public office as well, and not just talking about politicians. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Okay, thank you. Um, just in relation to your response you made to Ms Kelly around transfer functions, when do you envisage that coming to you and to the committee? We think it will be triggered, Chair, either through the Executive Office or possibly through the DERA committee, um, because the process has to be initiated by the department that currently has the function um, in order to transfer it to us. So I know that both DERA and the Executive Office are very live to this now that we have Ministers and Executive back and have work in place to um, affect the, the transfer of functions order. As the Minister says, it has the effect of, of putting right the intention of the Executive at the time when departments were being recreated in 2016. Um, I'm not sure quite why it got missed, but it did, and that's a reality. I suspect the bigger challenge will actually be once the Reservoirs Act transfers to us. Um, it will be the commencement of, of most of the provisions in that Act, because at the moment the vast majority of them remain uncommenced. Mm -hmm. So if I thought, and I initially did when I was made aware of, of this situation, that the transfer of functions order might be 
the main solution. It actually is only the start of a process that then <coughs> allows us to take the action that the Minister has outlined to make sure that we have greater guarantees around <coughs> safety um, and also to make sure that we have the right proportionate responses to um, the very issues that Dolores mentions around not creating problems where they don't need to be created, but also making sure that there is a robust set of proposals to keep people and places safe. Right. And there seems to be a bit of um, confusion in relation to the audit of um, reservoirs. You'd mentioned that it had been completed. When we put it to officials last week, they, they said it hadn't been completed, um, and they were a little bit unclear as to when that would be done, and certainly what the outworkings of that would be, and obviously the implications of it. There's been what we've been keen to do, Chair, in the absence of um, the right sort of statutory functions being transferred to us as, as, as much as we can legitimately do. So there has been a process of, of looking at individual controlled reservoirs, and the controlled reservoir is defined in the Act, as, as you probably remember from, from previous lives. Um, there has been a process at, at looking at which ones of those would perhaps give concern. Um, that process has gone underway up to a point. The next stage is actually visits to um, by some of our technical experts, including a, a reservoirs engineer, to look to see whether the information available to us is borne out on the ground. Um, one of the pieces of information that I learned about reservoirs was actually this is a piece of work best done at this time of year when um, vegetation is not as, as lush as it might be and when you can actually get to see some of the problems. So that work is underway. One of the practical issues we have is that these are quite often privately owned and on private lands, so we don't have the right of access unless it's with the agreement of, of the reservoir owner. Um, but it is a subject that I know you have in your work programme, and the um, colleagues that we have working on this will be able to give you a more detailed update on where we are. The other thing we have done in the meantime, and, and recognising the limitations of where we find ourselves, is we've worked very hard with multi-agency partners to make sure that we have the right contingency arrangements in place. You'll all be very aware of, of the situation that unfolded in August um, in, at the Todbrook Reservoir, and that has been a real reminder, I think, to all of us of the need to make sure that multi-agency arrangements are in place, as I say, to, to make sure that people are kept safe in the event that anything did happen. Yeah. And we, you know, we're really grateful for the support from other partners and have a very robust system. The, the team that I have on the Riverside is um, again, you'll be familiar with them from your, your old DARD days, but um, is very, very um, expert in terms of managing those sorts of risks. Okay, and, and, and absolutely appreciate that where there is a, a risk and there's a, a potential danger, but yeah. there are also reservoirs which have been redundant for absolutely. decades, mm -hmm. um, which yeah. are now having a critical impact on yeah. development plans and mm -hmm. for developers then moving forward in, in some of our, our, our local towns and villages. And that's, that's really why getting the function property transferred yeah. and then getting the act worked through to make sure that we have the right powers to do the right things uh, is really say, important. I have to say, I haven't been filled with any confidence in, in relation to my experience in, in terms of both the Silent Valley Reservoir issue and Lurgan Park Lake in terms of the response from officials. Okay, well, we'll, we'll certainly be revisiting this. Um, on several times probably over the next few weeks just with, with, with various stakeholders. So Absolutely. And I think one of the challenges has been the very limited powers that we find ourselves having, um, which has been a, a real difficulty. You're absolutely right. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Chair, but it was also about consultation with other stakeholders and we didn't see any of that. Okay, thank you. Mr Boylan. Thank you, Chair, and could I welcome the Minister and wish her well at her post. I know she'd been bounced and right into it. Uh, just, Chair, just quickly go back, because I mentioned MOT uh, issues. I do support you in relation to the 40-year-old vehicles. I mean, a lot of people have contact with us. But just back to the specifics in terms of legislation, I think, Minister, that there is a statutory instrument there that we may be able to use okay. uh, in relation to the two years and also the extension. Mm -hmm. And I would appreciate you, certainly you said you'd look at that. Mm -hmm. And uh, you'll come back to us. The other point I'd like to make is they're proposing in the south to run with 80 or 90 percent of the test and leave that section out. Is, is that something you've considered? Or it, is. it is. Yeah, I did. Um, as soon as I became aware that um, the south had adopted this approach, I immediately looked at it. The difficulty that we have is that uh, 
under the current system that I've initiated, once you get the temporary exemption certificate, DVLA will allow you to tax your vehicle to keep it on the road. They will not allow you to tax a vehicle if you've only done a partial test, and that was where it would fall down. So we could give partial tests, but that would not allow people to tax their vehicle and keep it on the road. So the cleanest uh, and easiest uh, way of dealing with this was just moving to the temporary exemption certificates. But I did look at it as an option, but it just wouldn't have allowed or facilitated the taxation of vehicles. Okay, I appreciate that. Chair, I have three or four questions. I'll, I'll move through them as quickly as possible. I'm mindful other people have questions, and I'll try and stay away from the parochiality. Oh, I worry. think that we I mentioned know fairly well. Fair play to my colleague, but. Uh, obviously, you mentioned the taxis industry, and, and we've went through the legislation for a number of years, and there is still concerns over it. And I appreciate it definitely within the city, yeah. and also I think West Belfast tax mentioned. Um, when do you hope to engage with them, and I mean try and try and iron some of the problems out? Yeah, well, I, I've asked officials, as it said, there to get me a submission um, in the next couple of weeks. As soon as I have time to consider that, I'd want to move very quickly to meet with all stakeholders on this to make sure that I am as up to date and as informed on it as possible. So I do look forward to meeting representatives of the ta taxi industry very, very soon. Okay. And in terms of the, the application, I know the, the gold mine issue yes. over the Spurns. Yes. And would you like to, because we update on that or, or your response to that? Please? Yeah. Uh, so that's an, a, a number of uh, applications. Um, obviously, I'm limited in what I can say because I have to allow due process to follow. But I am very mindful of the complexity of that particular application. I'm also very mindful um, of the strength of feeling uh, about that application. Um, and so it's something that I want to consider in great detail. Okay. Minister, you, you mentioned, uh, and you're going to have a lot of conversations with Minister Murphy. You may bring a picnic yes. basket with you. Put a good one in for uh, me ahead uh, Yeah, of absolutely. <laughs> you may bring a flask with you as well. Um, the thing is, over, a lot of us now experience these issues in dealing with traffic camming and, and yeah. some of the programmes that's run out in local councils. Um, and there's no doubt I'd say all the members would support, support any of the road safety measures. I mean, obviously that's the budget you'll, you'll go after and try and address, because I know even in my own area, parochial, and maybe others, mm -hmm. we, we would certainly, as a committee, support a lot of road safety, but, and they can't, they can't uh, be taken yeah. forward because of the lack of funding. Um, just would you like to comment on that? Yeah. Or you I mean, the, the, the budget there again, uh, you know, it is it's fallen to significant um, <coughs> cuts, and we're not able to do what we want to do. It, my approach to this is I have a responsibility for road safety, but also if we are serious about trying to encourage children to walk to school, then we need to make our schools safe in terms of the traffic surrounding it. So for me, these projects are not just about road safety. It's about the physical, um, mental well-being and health uh, of our children. Um, it's about community cohesion and, and all of these things. So certainly, you know, these are the things that I'm going to be pressing on. Um, and again, it's that point that I made earlier about the street lights and the potholes. These are things that communities really care about. Parents taking their children to school, walking about in their neighbourhoods. If they feel safe, you know, then you know that as a, an executive you're doing your job. So just to reassure the member, uh, these are the issues that I'm focused on. I'm going to try to do what I can within my own budget. but. You know, as I, gave, I, I specifically laboured in my presentation about the financial difficulties that I have, so that I'm being realistic with people in terms of managing expectations. But that doesn't mean that I am not ambitious about trying to do what we can, because sometimes in those instances, it's not huge sums of money in the scheme of things, but the multiple benefits that you get from them hugely outweigh the investment. So it is something that I'm, I'm very, very uh, keen to try to do more on. No, I appreciate it. Uh, in terms of Brexit and the impact it has, both in terms of infrastructure obviously is a threat now to all of that yeah. and in terms of, of transport as well any further comments i know you mentioned earlier on in your commentary or your presentation i mean i would have some reservations in terms of now the funding that's been committed and maybe not committed i know you know so i mean we, we just um, we definitely need to I know. continue that just a couple of parochial issues the north yeah. south interconnector yes uh, minister i mean which i understand we definitely need the infrastructure there are 6,500 objections in my own immediate area to it. Um, the application is obviously in for overgrounding. Um, your, your views on, on uh, where it's at at the minute, because I, mean, I, I definitely know, I would hope that the Minister, if she gets the opportunity to, to visit the constituency, mm -hmm. th this is a major issue for us. No, uh, I appreciate of, that. And a lot of objection to it. I mean, and people are, they support the interconnection, but they're asking for underground. 
is a difficult one for us. You know? Yeah, again, it, it's a live planning application, so restricted in terms of what I can say, and we have to follow due process. But I am aware that it's a strategic project. I'm also aware of community feeling on it. Um, I am I'm awaiting uh, information coming up from officials, so I haven't received any submission on it uh, as yet. But obviously, when it comes up, we'll go through it in detail to try to understand it. But I am conscious of feeling, uh, and I also have to weigh up the strategic with local and also with the financial viability of everything. So not an easy task, but I want to do it with an evidence-based approach and as fairly and robustly as I can. Okay, and finally, finally Chair, the, and this is one that we've been waiting for a long time, and I asked the officials previously, the North West and East Link roads in Armagh, I mean, have been touted for a number of years. Yeah. And I mean, travelling to Armagh City in the morning time, you mean you need to leave at six o'clock to get to travel one mile around the city. Um, it's not on, the, I not on the. I don't see it on the list, but I mean, I would certainly encourage the minister. You know, that's something we definitely need to look at as, as part of a new deck and new approach. The issues of, of taking cars off the road and all that. You have cars that are sitting there, engines over torn and, and the pollution. I mean, uh, our mass certainly has 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 fair share of it. So I'd appreciate the minister come back to me in that there and see where. Yeah, I'll have a look at it. I have to say, you know. Um, I've got a huge insight into the difficulties that we face in terms of a road network right across the north. I'm, you know, have multiple requests in from members to, you know, address issues, and they're all important. So what I have to do is to look to see through the priorities uh, and also be mindful of just the financial situation. But I'm happy to come back to the member on that particular one. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you. And just working alongside what Mr. Boyle has said, and obviously it's something which is a regional issue. Um, but there's a project ongoing in relation to greenways, obviously encouraging um, people off the, out of their cars and um, having safe spaces um, for both leisure but also for commuting. Um, can we have an update from you in relation to the greenways project? Yeah, so this is something that I am very supportive of. I think it sits very well with the priorities that I have about connecting communities and also uh, about the environment. Um, what I want to do is to take a fresh kind of look at some of the strategies, uh, the greenway strategies, not to uh, create a whole new strategy and, a, and a, a process. What I want to look to see is the actions that I can possibly take between now and the next two years to try to advance that. So it's something that I'm up for. It's something as well that I want to look at on an all-island basis because I think there are big opportunities there. Um, uh, and so I look forward to working with my um, my counterpart in the south. I actually met with Sustrans yesterday uh, and Greenways was one of the issues that we spoke at length about. So I've said to them that it's an issue uh, and a a piece of green infrastructure that I'm committed to. I can see the benefits of it, so it's what I can do physically and actively to promote that agenda within these two years. Okay. Because obviously there are evidence of very successful greenways, particularly Absolutely. around the Belfast area, and I suppose it's something that has captured people's imagination, and they do want a safe space for to be able to travel alongside the um, leisure time with their children, particularly. And, and I think that there are huge benefits if you look at the Cumber Greenway. You know, it addressed so many issues and problems that we were having, flooding and so forth, as well as creating a safe space, you know, community cohesion, getting people active. So I think greenways are not just the answer to greater physical activity and sustainable transport. I think we could actually use them as a creative way of dealing with a number of problems around antisocial behaviour and things that actually are really <coughs> troubling uh, our constituents. So I think it's a creative answer to a number of our problems. Yeah, given that everyone's being parochial, perhaps I could put a bit in there for, for lighting of the Cumber Creek. <laughs> <Right. laughs> um, just throw it in there, Chair, throw it in, absolutely. Thank you, Mr Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, and maybe for the record, just to clarify, I was previously an employee of TransLink, yes. also a councillor in Ards and North Danborough Council. Just to welcome the Minister to her role and wish her best wishes for the, the term ahead. Um, the Assembly passed a motion on Monday declaring a climate emergency. Uh, I think it's incumbent upon all of us uh, in whatever roles we have then to act in response to that. Uh, and one thing around that is uh, in terms of the rebalancing of investment around sustainable transport and just to have a view from the Minister on how she would potentially want to take that forward because yeah. we're still a very car dependent society in Northern Ireland mm -hmm. and but uh, we, and it's important that we have appropriate infrastructure in place but the view in terms of how can we ensure that we prioritize sustainable transport in terms of financing 
I want to thank the member, and I'm very disappointed you're not wearing a dicky bow today, Andrew. <laughs> um, Next week. Oh, so, so me, <laughs> Andrew. Um, no, I, I very much welcome uh, the Assembly uh, declaring the climate emergency, uh, and I do believe that I need to be doing everything within my department and also work, working with executive colleagues. Um, and Minister Poots and I have already had a conversation about how he and I can work together and bring our departments together to do uh, what we can collaboratively to tackle the climate emergency. And so I look very much forward to that. You've seen my intention to bring forward to the committee the e-bike uh, legislation. I think that has an important part to play. Um, I attended the launch of the three new hydrogen fuel buses at TransLink. You know, a significant amount of investment is required, but you know, you're moving and it's a step gear change in the move to zero carbon emissions. Yeah. That's the kind of thing, exciting projects that I would like to see us uh, more involved in. I think the big challenge for us here is going to be about changing people's behaviour and cultures. As you rightly say, we're a very car dependent mm -hmm. um, society in many ways, and people be very precious about their cars. I suppose a challenge for me, and this is what I'm trying to think through, is you know, my job is to try to change people's behaviour, encourage them out of their cars, but at the same time, I need to be incentivising them using public transport. And that requires resource, and that's where the tension is always going to be. But it's something that I am committed to trying to do. You know, in a small way, choosing to go with the e-car, you know, it wasn't a big step by any means. But what I wanted to do was to signal that if I'm going to be practicing pe to pe preaching to people to, you know, change their behaviour in many ways, then I need to be practicing what I pr preach. Yeah. So, um, you know, it is an agenda that I'm genuinely committed to. I think there's a lot of opportunities with infrastructure, um, and it's about challenging people and their behaviours. For me, the big answer is around transport, public transport, encouraging people off. If you look at the Belfast Rapid Transit, there is a 90% uh, reduction in uh, nitrogen oxide emissions across the Rapid Transit corridor. You know, that's hugely beneficial. So I hope to see that extended to the north of Belfast and to south as well. But I think public transport, changing modes of behaviour, getting people more active in their in their travel are key ways of trying to deliver on that. Yeah, thank you, Minister. And you know, having an e-car is a small thing, but that's all small things come together and allow us to deliver a change. So I think it's a collective effort on behalf of everyone, and I do welcome that. And the we just need more charging points. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Major, yeah. Yes. Uh, just a couple of other things. Um, it was mentioned in the first day brief around Class A private hire taxis and bus lanes, and whether the minister has <laughs> any view in relation to that, because it's an issue of concern, obviously, for a number of people. Yeah, it is very much an issue of concern, and it's an issue of concern <coughs> for taxi drivers, and it's also an issue of concern, that, for example, Sustrans raised with me yesterday. Um, so what I want to do is I want to, as part of I'd said about the taxi situation, trying to get a better understanding. So what I want to do is to engage with a range of stakeholders um, to take to take a view on that, uh, and that's something that I want to do going forward as well. So, yes, I, I understand the difficulties from all sides. Um, I want to hear from people, get informed, and then I think we need to move to a, a, a decision on that. Yeah, I think it's important to, to move to a decision. I would yeah. encourage not to be permitting, but that's my own personal view. Uh, in relation to uh, Greenways, a number of the councils have taken forward schemes in relation to that, with the hope that the assembly would be restored and there would be grant funding to enable them to proceed. So a lot of them have done a lot of groundwork in that and done the consultation. So I just hope that as part of that review we can get that concluded yes. as soon as possible, yes. so we can get those uh, to to proceed. Yes. Um, one other issue, and it's um, another thing which we're waiting with during our three-year hiatus, uh, was the road closure legislation. So that legislation was made in the dying days of this assembly and. Uh, the impact of that has been well known, uh, particularly upon smaller events. Um, they have been cancelled, or the, the cost associated with running these events has been quite significant. Um, and it's just whether the ministers have a view in relation to how to address these concerns, because um, government should be about enabling um, positive lifestyles um, and healthy lifestyles. Uh, but this legislation is inhibited in that, and it's just to see if there's a way forward in resolving those concerns. It's certainly something that I will look at, and I'm happy to meet the member on. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I think that one of the real desires is to have a review of the legislation. I think mm. that would be useful, um, so we could take that forward. Um, the, the last one's really around the, the, the MOT situation. Yep. Um, I think in all of this, the, the, the key concern must be safety, uh, safety of the staff and safety of uh, road users. Um, and um, I would urge the minister, for whatever decisions are being taken, to consider the whole road safety issue, because yeah. whilst uh, motorists are 
obliged to ensure that their vehicle is roadworthy, um, and the MOT is not uh, sort of the sort of, that's you done. Uh, you, you have to that's your responsibility every single day to do that. Uh, whatever is done has to ensure that the road safety is paramount in, in concern, uh, and also around the safety of staff. And um, obviously, this situation came about, and the, the, the lifts are, are no longer in use, but. Whether there is a view that the independent assessments that are being undertaken at the present moment in time, whether they should have been done previously, because I've just got a concern that this has came to light, and whether there should have been independent assessments of this at an earlier stage. Uh, in terms of the road safety, um, absolutely. Um, the department. One of the things that I've said is that the department needs to be very uh, direct and frequent in its communication with members and the public on the MOT situation. I've taken that decision myself. We have been putting out a consistent message about the road safety importance. And yes, you're right, it ultimately is the responsibility of the vehicle owner. Um, and I think it's, it's in the midst of, of all of the difficulties, you know, I think it's a helpful reminder to all of us. I mean, it's something that we're considering now. People have raised this with me about the four month extension, you know, the impact <coughs> on road safety. At the same time, some of the same people have been saying you need to move to testing every two years as opposed to one. So again, it just reinforces the need for owners and drivers of vehicles to make sure that they're, at every day of the year, uh, you know, that their car is um, safe to be on the roads and, yeah. and it's, it's, it's a maximum in terms of, of roadworthiness. In terms of the independent assessment, I think what we're falling into there is the, the issue of the, the contracts. That is an issue of concern to me in terms of the inspections, um, the eight weekly maintenance um, inspections, the six monthly thorough inspections. It does seem to me to be very strange that cracks were only identified in November um, and then were identified in so many lifts. So that has th thrown up a number of very serious questions and concerns for me, which is why one of the independent reviews on the auditor side is actually going to specifically look at the contract in itself and it's certainly something that I have been raising with officials because it does throw up a number of questions uh, and concerns for me. Okay, thank you very much Minister. Thank you. Okay, thank you Mr Beggs. Again uh, Minister Mann, I'd like to congratulate you on your appointment and welcome you to the yes. committee um, and can I also <laughs> wish that we'll have a, an open and transparent cooperative arrangement between the committee and thank you and your staff for being so open in the, the visit to the uh, Balmoral DDA Centre. I think it was useful that we would see the problem firsthand. Yeah. Uh, some minute cracks in some instances, yeah. which obviously can grow. Um, but just to get an understanding directly from uh, uh, those working in that area was, was very worthwhile uh, and appreciated that. Indeed. But the, the, there is a major problem coming here in four months' time when suddenly the cars double up. And we still have the issue of some four-year-old cars where uh, I suspect because of pressure on incoming phone calls that people are not being contacted uh, when their, their, their appointments are coming due. I don't know if come back by uh, a constituent on Friday where that, that was the issue. Uh, and he went to the centre himself and he, he got the issue you dealt with. Um, yeah. There's also then the issue of, of sewn cars. So, do we, we only have about half the capacity, as I understand it, that we used to have. So are uh, those who need to keep their roadworthy cars back on the road being afforded timely opportunities or exemptions? Because the other side of road safety here is you could end up with members of the public walking uh, on country roads, unlit roads, uh, children perhaps not being collected by their parents because the car is off the road. So that's another balancing road safety aspect that you have to take into consideration. So, so my, my question at the end of all of this is how soon do you feel you'll have the information uh, available to take a decision on further exemptions? Because that, you're going to have to create capacity some way and I can only see it coming from further exemptions uh, uh, to let us get over the spike that we know is coming. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Um, you know, there is an immediate issue in terms of we need to prioritise the four-year-old vehicles for testing. I am seeking legal advice because I'm, I understand that if I were to try to extend or issue a TEC to the four-year-old vehicles, then I would be in breach of the roadworthiness directive. So it's not as straightforward as I initially thought it might be as a common sense uh, approach. So we are prioritising those vehicles alongside taxis and the car dealerships with imminent sales. 
There is an issue around contact in, in the sense that we don't hold, DVA does not hold contact details for all of its customers. That's something that it's now working to rectify. It's come to light in, in terms of this particular problem, so it is working to resolve that. I had asked for a helpline. Um, I would have liked to have been able to launch that helpline for the priority customers, but I want to be absolutely sure when it launches that it is at maximum capacity and that it will not create any further headaches for customers. But I would be very hopeful that we can launch that um, as soon as is possible. At the moment, it is being tested just to make sure that it is an effective helpline service. Even though you're absolutely right, I'm not just focused in on this immediate crisis. I have to have the foresight to look that in four months' time, there is going to be a big problem here. That's why I'm looking to extend the TECs, the temporary exception certificates, to the vans. I also am considering at the moment and making sure that, if required, I do have measures in place to extend the period of the TECs for the other vehicles. Now, I can do that for a further two months because it's only a six-month maximum period that you can give for temporary exemption certificates, but I want to reassure uh, many members that I am trying to horizon scan to see what do we need to do in the here and now, what do we need to do being mindful that in four months' time there's a potential avalanche, how can we buy ourselves more time, but also through all of that, are we doing absolutely everything that we can to make sure that we are getting business recovery? Uh, back as quickly uh, as possible. So I do want to reassure members I'm looking at, and as I said previously, part of that consideration is moving the MOT test from an annual uh, situation to every two years as well. So I am looking at a range of options, doing everything I can that's possible within the current legislation, but I'm absolutely proactively looking at what I need to do in terms of changing regulations uh, and, and legislation. I'll be very much you know, reliant on the support of the committee in terms of help me to make that happen. In terms of moving around there more, and in terms of dealing with the backlog of investment that's needed there, <clears throat> um, where there's I think about 100 different sites need upgraded, and at present, no new planning permissions, which would uh, require yeah. additional pressure on the sewage grid, are being granted. So it's affecting new house building, it's affecting office development, factory development. Uh, I'm just flagging that it is vital no. that we move Northern Ireland water forward, and it's presently a GOCO, a government-owned company, so separate companies' law it has to apply with, and then it's a, also a non-departmental public body, so it's got the, the public bureaucracy to deal with. Um, would you acknowledge that if it, if it were a mutual, not-for-profit uh, GOCO company, private company, um, or if it was a, if it was a separate operation? that uh, we could cut down the amount of bureaucracy and also possibly access additional funds, even using the, the, the current payments that are presently being passed to it from the public purse and not uh, requiring any further burden. I, I, I totally understand and accept the scale of this problem, you know, in terms of the, the impact that it's having on limited um, development, uh, growth, uh, house building. What I have to say is that uh, you know I've been very impressed by the level of political awareness of this situation. It's no longer the case that you're having to make the case that Northern Ireland water needs an investment. It is widely recognised. So we now are in the thing. Well, if we rec recognise it, what are we actually going to do about it? Uh, I have no definitive decision made around the nature of Northern Ireland water as an organisation, um, but I do want to have a conversation with executive colleagues and with the committee about how we might look and create a how we might look creatively at the organisation. I mean, it does have borrowing powers. Um, you know, how do we utilise that? What is the best model going forward? What I want to do as well is look at best practice. So look across these islands to see um, how their water organisations are funded, how they're structured, what the benefits are to customers and all of that before I take a, a position myself. But obviously it'll be something that I want to be discussing with executive colleagues. It's certainly going to be an issue when I'm giving my presentation to them uh, next week that I'll be raising with them. It's an issue that we have to address. Okay. Re reservoirs were pick, uh, referred to earlier and I understand there's been, uh, just over 30 are deemed to be poor or very poor. Mm. So are we moving in, uh, uh, and yet nothing can be done because uh, the, legis that the transfer is not being completed, there's no enforcement happening. Uh, so this is an issue potentially of public safety. So how urgently is this issue being addressed by other departments and the executive? Well, I to pick that yeah. one up. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. And one of the things, um, certainly when 
I came into post was the importance of me working very closely with my dear colleague, um, who has the happy position of the intention of the, the function transferring for, to us, um, but that not happening. So we have been working very closely with DARA. I have no doubt that now that we have ministers back, we will see the transfer functions moving very, very quickly. Um, that has to happen. The other thing we have done is, we've, to be honest, we've, we've tried to flex the limited powers we have as much as possible to make sure that we understand the nature of the issue, as I mentioned earlier to the Chair, to make sure that we have the, the contingency arrangements in place, um, but also to develop the understanding of, of what does poor condition look like and what are the, the remedies that might be put in place. Um, we are hugely restricted in terms of the powers that we have at the moment. Um, one of the uncommenced powers in the Reservoirs Act would be the, the placing of responsibility on reservoir owners um, to make sure that they, they keep their assets in, in good condition and that's one of the areas that I think will be the subject once we get the function transferred of debate around this table. Um, I understand it was a subject at the time of some considerable debate around the, the um, previous DARD committee in terms of the right levels of responsibility including between government and individual owners. Finally, you mentioned about keeping your assets in appropriate condition. <coughs> uh, in, in terms of our roads, that certainly that's not the case. Uh, and there's a line of thing that we need to secure our assets before continuing to go. add. Now, obviously, there's yeah. road safety improvements that have to be done, but we seem to be fixated in building more and more and more and more roads and more and more bridges, but then abandoning them and not, not maintaining them. Yeah. Have we got the balance right? We have, we, we're responsible for something in the region of £400 um, billion pounds worth of public assets. That's a, a significant um, level of public asset. We ought to be experts, um, we'd calculate spending around £400 million every single year just on maintaining them, and, and you're absolutely right, we're, we're nowhere near that. Um, and the Minister has already outlined some of the challenges that presents. One of the particular frustrations for me is around the value for money of um, the fact that, as the Minister said, it costs on average four times more to repair something than it would have done to um, structurally maintain it correctly in the That's first place. So have you're absolutely right. right. We are spending a lot of our capital budget immediately goes out onto key flagship projects. Um, we should be spending 100, 140 odd million a year just on structural maintenance of the roads infrastructure. Um, we've had the best two or three years in the last couple of years in recent times, and that's been opening position of about 75. And the reality is that every every year that you don't spend 140, you're storing up bigger problems. So there is a challenge for us in terms of how seriously we take maintaining the assets that we have versus wanting to see new ones. And it's not just the roads, because that also applies to the rail infrastructure and actually to the bus fleet. And we've already discussed to water and sewerage. So a conversation, you're absolutely right, around what's the right balance. I suppose you know, the difficulty I'm encountering taking up this post is um, budgets have been severely curtailed. And you have flagship executive projects that parties are committed to delivering on. You then have the new decade, new approach commitments that parties um, are, want to deliver on. And then you also have ministerial priorities within that. If you had much more money, the truth is you would get the balance better. Uh, and the difficulty is that we're stuck in a bind where, particularly if you look, if you're serious about regional imbalance, you have to look at the A5, you had to look at the A6. Um, but in the same sense, all of us around this table could name numerable roads, roads in our constituencies where the quality is not acceptable and people's cars are being injured, people are coming off bikes. So in terms of answering the question, is the balance right? Unless we get significant uplift in terms of Barna consequentials across from the UK government and Boris Johnson says infrastructure is going to be his government's you know, real impetus in terms of transforming things, if we get an uplift in the Barna consequentials, if you know, a significant proportion of that does stay as capital, then I can try to get the balance better. But it's just unfortunately that's the situation is. I don't think any of us would ever say we're getting the balance absolutely right because there are so many competing priorities. It's what can we do within available budgets to maintain existing stock but also offer new opportunities for people who haven't had the investment before. It's that tension all the time. It seems to me there's many 
the funding has changed over the last number of years, and even the latest deal, the funding is not there for all the promises that are within it. And do we have to cut our cloth uh, by our means? And yes, let's hope that something comes further down the line with consequentials. But to continue <coughs> with a, a high-level schemes when we can't fill the potholes in or do regular maintenance seems to be ridiculous and wasteful of public funds. Okay, thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Thank you, Chair. Um, also, I'd like to welcome the Minister. Say the, the, the best to last, as they say. So, uh, two more. <laughs> so two more. <laughs> right, close. He's close. He's got it. He's nearly got it right. Second last. Right. Second last. So, uh, you're very welcome. And just, just on your point, I do welcome your point that life doesn't uh, revolve around Belfast, and I appreciate that. And I don't mean that in a flippant manner. I've never but, done uh, that. Everybody's getting parochial, and, and my colleague to my right here doesn't want to build any new roads, but I do ultimately. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at my Ulster, and I'm going to be a little bit parochial. <coughs> uh, with the engineering capital of Northern Ireland and the food processing capital of Northern Ireland, so it's something to bear in mind. Yes. But the, the Macrofell bypass now, which is effectively pushing Cook, uh, transport to money more in Cookstown, will ultimately be needed to look long term at linking, no. not by a, a, a dual carriage, but bypassing all roads between M1 and M2 to give a, a, a circular of the lock, because it is an engineering and, as I said before, food processing point. Uh, just I want to move on to the MOT. Questions or a couple of points, and I appreciate with another discussion coming in shortly after that. Yeah. The advice you're getting, Minister, regarding the business recovery and engineering reports, when do you see? I know you, you can't give us a timeline on when the, the centres is going to be up to full speed, but when are you going to have that report on your table so you can then make decisions whether you're buying lifts, repairing lifts, or what you're doing with lifts? So the, the engineering consultant commenced their work on the 3rd of February. On Monday, there will be an update report. So what I have said is that I need an urgent report. I don't want to compromise the robustness of that by putting an artificial deadline, but the engineers know that this is a matter of urgency and so are committed to getting that report to me as quickly as possible. And who, who are, I don't need obviously the company, but who are they engineers? Are they an insurance inspection? Or are they a, a, a private company? Private company? Yep, that's right. Um, they have been appointed through a framework contract um, through CPD, which gives both the Minister and me assurance in terms of um, the, the procurement approach. But they do need a wee bit of space and time to get the work done and to get the report to the Minister um, very early next week, which will give us, I think, a better sense of what the next steps are. There's a, there's a balance there in terms of wanting something very urgently, um, but also not wanting to constrain um, independent, whether it's either the auditors or the experts, in terms of saying, you know, if you have to have it done by X, does that constrain you in terms You're of what you look a report at? Early next week. Yeah. And, and then the, yeah, well, I've, I've, I'm expecting an update, update on Monday. Uh -huh. okay. yeah. You see, regarding the lifts in general, is, yeah. is the minister aware of a life cycle or a time of those lifts? So in other words, they're fitted 2011, 2012. I understand. Mm -hmm. Is the Minister aware of a, a time that those had to be changed? Now, not in years, but purely life cycles or cycles of the lift being? Um, maybe a good idea to pick that up with the officials. My understanding was that um, there was a kind of an assessment carried out in the latter part of last year that didn't indicate that the lifts were beyond their life cycle. <coughs> yeah. So the back end of 19? Yes. Okay. okay. Moving on to insurance. Um, we have road fatalities in Northern Ireland every year, unfortunately. My concern is there will be a fatality based with a car that has no technically MOT. Does that concern you? Yes, it does. Um, when, I, when I took the decision to issue the temporary exemption certificate, so I became aware of this situation. It's Tuesday, the 21st of January, that there was an issue with a lift. On the Wednesday, uh, I was then advised that there were concerns around safety concerns for all of the lifts, that they need to be taken out of operation. And then I moved the temporary exemption certificate, issuing them on the Friday, because I just felt that the situation was going to be you know, quite expansive. And of course, one of the considerations that I had in doing that was exactly that concern, that do I issue a temporary exemption certificate and then a situation develops after that involving a car with a temporary exemption certificate? So as a human being, yes. But that's why I have to press the, the, the message that drivers and owners are ultimately responsible for their own vehicle. And it'd be helpful for, if the committee were able to reinforce that message too. Um, but that's one of the reasons why I want to get the business operable as quickly and as safely as possible, because 
you know, issuing temporary exemption certificates is not ideal and it's not a solution in itself. It's essentially buying us time to try to get over this difficulty uh, and get this problem properly resolved. Um, but you know, that's why I'm pushing for interim options in terms of maximising capacity and making sure that every option that is possible in terms of restoring the business as quickly as possible, all of those measures are put in place. Okay, just to move on to street lights, Pat, I appreciate your point and you have covered it. Yeah. It's a good signal to, to, to the man or woman on the I street so. that they see something happening and that the light outside their home or on their road is repaired to get that signal across. So I welcome that and I welcome something happening on that yeah. soon. I appreciate we're moving into the lighter nights, but people still up early and people still work late. Final question then, uh, we discussed briefly last week regarding if uh, there's a local issue locally and I want to meet my engineer, as I call it, in Mid Ulster or someone else's colleague. <coughs> That apparently that goes right up to you now, Minister, is that correct? No. So what happened was, um, uh, basically because we haven't had an, um, ministers in post for three years, systems and processes have had to adapt. Um, now that the ministers were back, it was the permanent secretary actually, and uh, uh, she, I'll have she can to. speak for yeah. it, but mm -hmm. um, what I want to reassure members is that there was um, a memo from the permanent secretary to say, look, we have to have processes in place. Right? Um, and what I want to do is, I want to make sure that officials or elected members can access officials. I also want to be made aware if there are issues of real concern to members and communities. I want to be aware of that so that I can try to do what I can to address it. I understand that it was in the process of taking time out to bring me up to speed on issues. There was a small number of meetings that were arranged between elected representatives and officials that were cancelled. But my understanding is that all of those have been rescheduled. And if it's not, I would encourage members to let me know. So was those requests going over your desk, Katrina? Or? No, the, the, the system we have is that there is absolutely no change in terms of officials meeting with elected representatives. That's really important, actually. Um, the two things I have asked for, um, and the Minister's alluded to, to one of them, one of them, uh, and you'll all appreciate the reasons for this, um, one of them is that there are proper records kept of discussions, meetings, agreements. That's really important. Um, we've had a period... It's interesting, we're a department that was created in May 16. We've operated for about eight months with ministers. We've operated for about three years without ministers. So actually, as a department, we're learning um, how to come together under the direction and control of a, of a new minister because we only have had a very, very short period of time with that. So proper records are absolutely critical. The second thing that I have asked officials to do is to make sure that they report in um, on the key topics, um, any key issues and any key resolutions from those meetings. That's important, as the Minister says, to make sure that she's aware of the things that are concerning elected representatives. It's important as well for another reason, and that's because things may seem to be local individual issues, but actually if they're happening in three or four or five or six localities, they might point to a bigger issue, um, a more strategic issue, or something that might need a more systematic approach um, from the, the centre of the department, from the minister, from um, me and the senior management team. So those are the two changes in place, um, robust and proper records, and a report back mechanism so the Minister is always aware of the sorts of issues that are concerning you and your constituents. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, thank Mr. You. Mr Hilditch. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Minister, over the last year or so, we've, we've heard of the great success of the glider. Yes. Obviously on the east-west axis. Uh, there's a potential then that it will be extended north-south of the city. And maybe from a more parochial point of view from yourself, in North Belfast, would you be the preferred option being the Antrim Road or York Road? So, so what I've said is that um, I want to have proposals around viability of routes and I want to have an evidence-based approach. Then, obviously, when we have options, I would be going out to consultation on it and would be encouraging people to respond. So I haven't, I'm not coming at this with a closed mind. I can see there's two uh, routes potentially in North Belfast that are being touted, the Shore Road and the Antrim Road. I can see merits to both routes, but what I want to do is to base any decision that I take on the evidence that we have, um, but make sure that communities are consulted, residents are consulted, you know, traders are consulted. I think that's one of the lessons that we should learn from the first project with the glider. I think that we need 
do more to be uh, consulting with people and listening to people and involving people uh, in the process. So that's something that I very much want to do in terms of the second stage of the, the Glider project. Okay, and if any from myself then, uh, we haven't really touched upon cycling as such, but yeah. certainly there's a lot of issues out there in relation to cycling and um, uh, it needs further joined up approaches from the department to, to get the completion of, of appropriate cycling areas. So will you be talking about that as well? Yeah, again, I'm, I'm taking a look at the, the cycle strategy to see what we can do there. I'm also, I don't know if you're a member of the Cycling APG. I am, yeah. Are you? Yeah. Well, I, I've spoken to Chris Little uh, as well, the chair of that, to say that I want to have a positive engagement with the APG. So I'm hoping to meet um, with you as well uh, and with stakeholders. But I do think that there's a lot more that we could be doing in cycle. Again, for me, it's one of those other areas that doesn't require huge sums of money. Um, but for your investment, you can really make a big difference. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Boylan. Yeah, Chair, stone, my thunder was stolen there because that's the only other point I had. Because the glider, the glider has been a good success. We went and we seen the hydrogen bus last week and yes. we, we talked about the glider and I think you are meeting and talking to TransLink and it's just about phase two. Yeah. I mean, it's just one other point because as you listen to some of the members and they're talking about road safety and they're talking about rural roads, I mean, we have a large network of rural roads. And unfortunately, rural people have a dependency on single vehicles mm -hmm. because of the transport network. There's no point in saying. So, as part of the overall strategy, that's something we need to tackle if we're, we're seriously about addressing the issues of climate. No, I actually, know. everything else will be a big challenge. Anyways. And I actually meant to reference that point because you're absolutely right when I was answering a previous question. There is a tension in all of these things between the urban and the rural. Yeah. And the urban does lend itself in many ways to kind of a more progressive approach because it would have a more connected public transport mm -hmm. network, greenways and so forth. So I'm not forgetting about rural. Yeah. I understand maybe the speed of change might be a bit different there, but we need to be doing uh, what we can. I'm also conscious too about our rural roads. So there was a £75 million pound capital allocation for roads. Uh, £10 million of that went to the Road Recovery Fund, mm -hmm. and that's specifically really for the rural roads. And I can see the benefits yeah, of that. Absolutely. So that's something that you know I would want to make sure is maintained going forward when I start to look at you know the new budget that I have and what I can possibly do with it as well. Okay, Thanks, thank um, there will no doubt be further discussion around many of these issues and um, particularly around um, duplication of transport providers and so yes. on as well and, and community transport too um, and also the lack of, of particular routes particularly around um, some of our, our rural towns mm -hmm. the villages um, so we may want to, to revisit that yeah. at one stage there had been a, a pilot project in the oh, Lanterton Gannon area yeah. around integrated transport is there any further information in relation to that or whether that might be looked at again on community transport, mm -hmm. uh, just in relation to mm -hmm. the Don Gannon pilot? Yeah, it was, if, if I recall it correctly, Chair, it was um, looking at the scope to integrate between health education yes. um, and TransLink, and I think it did throw up a number of challenges around, uh, and I remember this from my education days, around some of the simple practicalities that um, things like sharing of buses become very difficult if you all want to use them for different purposes at exactly the same time of day, um, but certainly we can get an update to the committee on, on that. But my understanding is that the reality was that the integration of health education and TransLink turned out to be much more challenging on the logistics end than it actually you know, first appeared as a very sensible proposition. Okay, no, that's, that's good. Uh, just in relation to um, what the committee may expect legislation-wise from the department, are you in a position at this stage to give us an idea of what we may be looking at um, in the next couple of months? Moving up to summer recess. Yeah, I'm actually going to be. I'll write to you yeah. detailing it because we're trying to see what is legislatively possible to bring forward uh, and, and slots and so forth. So the e-bikes would be one. Yeah. I would be keen to try to look at um, uh, the drink driving and the drug driving. But the problem, not a problem, but the <coughs> the impediment to the progress that I want to make in terms of speed is around the testing equipment. Yeah. So that's mm -hmm. one of the issues, the breathalysing mm -hmm. equipment that I want to raise mm -hmm. with the chief constable. Uh, and we're engaging with the Home Office to see if we can try and move that forward. But what I will do is, um, if you're, you're okay with it, I'll write to the committee detailing you know, what I have an ambition in terms of legislation, and then we can work with the committee on timetable. Okay. Thank you. Members, have any other questions at this stage? No. Thank you. Can I thank you very thank much you. for you your time this morning, and we'll see you in, in the near future. Thank you, thank you Chair, thank members. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very you much.
members. Um, I suppose maybe just for information, before the committee um, was um, established, I had had a conversation with the clerk um, with regards to Northern Ireland Water and looking at some, op some options. Um, so previous committees had looked at um, various means of um, financial um, changes for how they would maybe get their money and, and I've asked um, research then to, to look at that and to bring that to the committee at, at some stage so that, that's a piece of work, work which is um, ongoing so just for members information just with regards to that okay so are we taking a big break here at the moment or are we just going on we could take a, a break for, a, for five, five minutes, minutes. Five minutes. Go on. Good. Assembly, Senate Chamber, Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. We're moving on into our briefing from the Drival and Vehicle Agency. Again, Hans Sard will record the meeting.
At page 108 of your packs, we have the hand sort of the committee briefing of the 28th of January, which included the briefing by Julie Thompson on the MOT Centre issue. And we then have a tabled nine, table paper to page 9, the update from the Minister on the DBA MOT Centres as of 3rd of February. Can I welcome to the committee Mr Paul Duffy, the Chief Executive, Driver and Vehicle Agency, and Ms Julie Thompson, the Deputy Secretary Planning, Water and DBA, the Department for Infrastructure. Um, you're both very welcome to the committee. Um, can I first of all um, thank officials for um, facilitating the committee members at the um, Boucher Road Test Centre last Wednesday. I know that all those who attended it found it incredibly useful and had the opportunity obviously to, to speak to staff and to see the issue <coughs> at first hand. Um, I, I'm not sure at this stage whether you want to make an opening statement or you would probably go yeah. straight into questions. Um, Julie, if you maybe want to give us an, an initial update. Yes, um, happy to do so. I, I was going to update uh, committee on, I, I guess, the, the key actions that have been taken over, over the last week since I was last here. And Paul would also like to give you an overview of the key aspects of DVA in that broader sense as well, if we can do those and then open to questions, uh, that, if that would work for yourselves. So, um, in terms of the last week and the, and the key actions that have been taken, um, we obviously have been giving priority to getting uh, TECs uh, processed for most customers. Uh, that's involved cancelling uh, appointments and then issuing the TEC instead as their MOTs are due. Um, we've also obviously then had to prioritise those vehicles that cannot get a TEC, as I explained last week. Uh, and as Minister has also explained, on the four-year-old cars, the taxis and the car dealerships. We have five lifts now uh, reopened uh, and operating, so three existing lifts have been independently inspected and uh, put into use. Um, and those, those lifts had no faults originally, uh, but we wanted to take the precautionary step to ensure they were independently assessed and uh, checked again before they were utilised. Uh, that's two in Lisburn and one in Belfast. Uh, and also two brand new lifts installed, um, one in Belfast and one in Derry. The one in Derry should be opening today. We've worked hard on communications and we appreciate that that's still an issue for folk. Um, we have a lot more information on the NI Direct website and we're pointing people to that. Uh, and we're trying to help and deal with customers as best we can in all sorts of circumstances. Um, and that's obviously been a, a priority in terms of getting that engagement in place. Um, we've also been working with various uh, key internal and external stakeholders, so whether that's trade union side and working patterns and <coughs> schedules and stuff like that, um, and also uh, external stakeholders, whether it's taxi drivers, uh, car dealers, freight transport, all of those have, have had various forms of engagement uh, working through. Um, as ministers also talked about, the two reviews have also started in, in the last week, and those are kicked off on, on working through, uh, as she has already explained. Um, and a lot of that, if you like, is keeping the basics of life moving forward and making sure that people are protected and are able to drive their cars. But we have also been turning our heads to the, the future. Um, and I think you've been having that conversation already as well. We have to look, and we are looking at other options. <clears throat> about how to get operations back in place as quickly as possible. Um, and there's a range of things in there, including the expert review that is working through on that. So that's the kind of work, I guess, over the last week that is happening. If I hand to Paul to give you a broader perspective on DVA, and then open to questions. Okay, thank you, Chair, for the opportunity <coughs> to speak to the committee today and for the committee's visit to Balmore Test Centre. I know the staff greatly appreciated um, the committee's attendance. Just to give you a sort of an overview of, of the driver and vehicle agency, our agency, our, our vision is for safer drivers and safer vehicles. So all of our functions, in some way, contribute to, to making people safer on the road. We are largely structured around um, three main functions. So we have driver and commercial licensing, driver and vehicle testing, and compliance and enforcement. Over the last three or four years, we've been embarking on a quite a significant digital transformation program, which touches on almost all of our services provided by DVA, and I'll highlight some of those developments when I'm talking about the individual functions and services that we deliver. Just as a little bit of background, there are approximately 800 <coughs> staff um, working within DVA, uh, a mixture of administrative and technical staff. Those technical staff are made up of 
vehicle examiners, driving examiners, enforcement officers. Um, the organisation is quite geographically dispersed. Um, we have three main administrative offices, one in Elmore Road Test Centre, one in Corporation Street, and one in County Hall, Colerain. Then we have their 15 MOT centres, two satellite driving test centres, and we also manage and own six way bridges um, for roadworthiness checks for the haulage industry. <clears throat> in terms of the main functions, Korean, uh, County Hall Korean is our main licensing hub, uh, where we're currently processing around 250,000 driver licenses a year. So these include both ordinary and vocational driving licenses. Um, and over the last three years, we've been working to digitalise a, a number of those uh, licensing transactions to make it much more efficient for our customers. Um, so at the moment, customers are able to go online and renew their driving license, and this also allows them the ability to pay for that license online and to upload their photograph. Um, they can either go to a photo booth or they can uh, upload it from their, their mobile phone. They can go online and change their address or request a, a replacement driving license. So this has greatly improved the turnaround times for, for applicants in, in renewing their licenses. One of the areas that we're currently working on is, and we're working closely with colleagues in the Department of Finance, is around identity assurance. Because if you're a first-time applicant for a professional driving license, we need to be able to uh, 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 sort of confirm your identity, and at the moment that is, is, is not possible. <coughs> also in Codem, we process commercial licenses, so that's for the bus and taxi industry. That include licenses for the operators, for the drivers, and for the vehicles. <coughs> And this has largely been a, a paper-based process, um, but we've now been in the process of finalising the development of a, a commercial licensing system, and that will allow operators to manage their fleets much more efficiently. And we've worked really closely with the taxi and the bus industry in developing that solution so it meets their business needs. Moving on from licensing, then the committee will be aware that we have responsibility for the roadworthiness test. Um, as I mentioned earlier, these are delivered from our 15 MOT centres across Northern Ireland. Last year we conducted around 1 million tests um, and the committee will also be aware of some of the challenges we faced last year in terms of waiting times. We have seen the demand for vehicle tests grow steadily um, over the last decade. Uh, the demand for the, t for the test is not uniform throughout the year. It tends to peak from January to May time, falls away over the summer, peaks again around September, October and then falls to its lowest point during uh, November, December, and that largely reflects new car registration when people don't tend to buy a new vehicle in, in, in December. So last year, in response to the growing waiting time issue, we, we introduced a number of measures uh, to address that issue. We have, we've accrued some, uh, a number of additional permanent vehicle examiners and also made use of some temporary vehicle examiners. We extended our opening hours during the summer to include Sundays and bank holidays. Um, we were I feel that we were in a, a good position for starting this year um, in terms of being on top of what the waiting time issue would be. We had preparations underway to open two additional test lanes in our new building's test centre, um, which was going to provide additional capacity of around 1,500 uh, tests per week. We are also in the process of appointing a construction company to commence the building of an additional MOT centre in Belfast at Hyde Bank. Um, it is planned to be completed in 2022, and this will provide additional capacity of around 90,000 uh, to the Greater Belfast area. We also have responsibility then for the delivery of the theory and the practical driving test. So we have around 70,000. Uh, we conduct around 70,000 theory tests a year, and around 60,000 practical driving tests. So again. Um, we've, we've looked at how best we can digitalise that to make it better for the customer. So now whenever you, when an applicant turns up to do their driving test, with their details already on a tablet device, the assessment of the test is recorded on the tablet device, and if the candidate passes the test, we can issue the driving licence remotely from the car that day. So it will be printed overnight in Swansea and, and posted immediately to the applicant. So it's a much greater turnaround and more a better service for our customers. And finally, just turning to compliance and enforcement, so we have a... We carry out um, enforcement operations with the haulage, the bus and the taxi industry, where we check on the roadworthiness um, at the roadside of vehicles and also the licensing entitlements of operators and drivers um, responsible for those vehicles. And we work very closely with uh, partner organisations such as the PSNI, HM Revenue Customs and other enforcement bodies in, in GB and in Ireland. And we would also work closely with the likes of the Education Authority on the safety of school buses. Um, again, in this area, we've, we've 
introduce some digital technology, <coughs> and so it allows our enforcement officers to have uh, access to information at the roadside, which allows them to take a more risk-based approach to enforcement and, and minimise any inconvenience then it may be caused to those who, those compliant operators and drivers, because those are the people we, we certainly do not want to be um, inconvenient, in, causing any inconvenience to. So, Chair, that's a, quite a quick uh, summary of the overall responsibilities and functions within DVA. Happy to take any questions, but I appreciate the committee will want to focus uh, to some extent on the current disruption within the, the MOT system. Okay, thank you very much. And um, obviously, you've now been thrust into a spotlight which you no doubt didn't want to be in. Um, but no doubt this really has been um, a disaster from a PR perspective for the uh, for DVA um, and also with regards to public confidence now um, moving forward. Um, communication, as you've indicated, is still an ongoing problem. It certainly was an issue a, a couple of weeks ago whenever this, this story broke. Um, and it will take, again, some time really for people to fully understand um, what's, what's going on. There will be people who, obviously, who had an immediate issue in relation to their MOT who will um, have received their, their TECs and will understand the process. But yet we'll have still many, many others who will not be just quite aware of how this is impacting on them. Um, I appreciate that um, you weren't in post when these lifts were procured at that particular time. Um, but are you aware if DVA was advised by the manufacturer um, as to whether these lifts would be fit for purpose for the number of um, lifts that they would be required to do, given the fact that, as you've mentioned in your opening comments, that there has been an increase in the number of vehicles being tested over the last 10 years? Chair, if I, I think back to um, the history of the procurement of the, the lifts. There was, at that time, a PFI contract in place, um, and the lift replacement was a refresh program as part of that P, PFI contract. Um, the lifts were replaced between August 2011 to November 2013, although the bulk of them were 2011 to 2012. Um, that was a, that, and, and that was the responsibility of the PFI contractor at the time. <coughs> there is no indication that there was a predetermined time period lifts should be used for. Um, there is, um, as part of the termination of that PFI contract, the ownership of the lifts then passed to DVA. Um, and at that time, that was May 2013, a preventative maintenance and service program was put in place. And the purpose of that program is to ensure the lifts are properly maintained and serviced and fit for purpose. Um, it also has built in, into it a reactive maintenance element to it. So if any part or element of, a, of, of the equipment within the test hall needs uh, repaired or replaced, then that gets flagged up and that's the, the process that's followed. So I, I think it, it's difficult to say a lift should be used for X number of years. It will depend on the usage. It will depend on, the, on how that lifts been maintained, um, but the purpose of those inspections on a week, eight weekly basis, on a six monthly basis, uh, is to try to identify as and when parts need replaced or failed. Just to be clear, at the time of purchase, there was no recommendation given from the manufacturer. Certainly not that I have been able to to uncover in any way. Okay, and I very much ex accept that there's a maintenance and an inspection routine obviously in place and, and you have a duty of care to your employers and also to or your employees, apologies, mm -hmm. and also to the, the service users at, at each of your sites. Um, but also obviously mindful that these lifts were ageing. In your business plan, had you any um, resource set aside for um, a period of refresh of each of those lifts? So throughout, um, so, so, so DVA as, as, as a trading fund is able to accumulate um, a, a level of reserves and those reserves must only be accumulated um, on the basis that there is a plan to use them. So normally we function on a full cost recovery so uh, and we're not entitled to make any sort of profit but it's, it's prudent to plan for future uh, investment. Um, within DVA's uh, accumulated reserves, there is an amount of money that has been accumulated to replace equipment. Um, it's prudent to do so because at some stage that equipment will need to be replaced. We're also mindful that with the development of the sighted hide bank, 
that there will be a requirement then to uh, purchase equipment to furnish that. Uh, so that, that has all been built into a plan in terms of building up sufficient reserves to allow that to happen. So it had been your plan to replace these it, lifts? It would be it, it, inevitably all the equipment in the test hall will have to be replaced at some time throughout its useful life. So what we would be doing is we'd be working very closely with the contractor in terms of understanding what maintenance was happening, what repairs they were recommending and what replacements they were recommending. So at the end of I think it was October 2018, we had asked the contractor to carry out a condition survey on all the equipment in the test halls, which includes lifts. We asked them to conduct that on the basis that we need to plan, is there any equipment that needs to be replaced in the future? Um, and also just to get a good sense of what condition our, our equipment's in. They carried out that, they produced that report in October 2018, which um, was a quite a comprehensive detailed report. I've looked at it in terms of the lifts. Um, for each individual lift, their assessment was that the lifts are, in their condition, was described as either good or acceptable, um, and no indication at that stage that lifts needed to be replaced. But we would normally then be asking for that uh, during our monthly service meetings that we would have with the contractor, in terms of um, if, if there are concerns about, so if you had a piece of equipment that was in uh, all 15 test centres that was starting to show defects, we would say that there would be, we would ask them, because there's a growing number of defects in this piece of equipment, does this need replaced? That hasn't been the case, certainly in terms of lifts. Okay, so up until two weeks ago, you had no intention to replace any of the lifts, with the exception of buying additional lifts for the new building site and obviously for the new complex at Hyde Bank. That's that right. the case. Um, so any monies which you currently have in your reserves, which of course we're not clear off at this stage, and perhaps been, you might like to enlighten yeah. us as to how much you have in reserve, um, but that any money that you did have is really committed to the Hyde Bank site. So given the fact that in last week's interview you, you cited that perhaps it could cost somewhere in the region between thirty and forty thousand pounds per lift to replace, and if we were to multiply that up, then it's quite a significant amount of money if we're in a position where we have to replace the majority of those lifts. And if your money is committed to Hyde Bank, for example, will you require assistance from the department? So the, the money that it's been... So I'll, I'll maybe set out what the level of reserves that are within DVA and, and then talk about the, uh, the, uh, the individual component that relates to equipment. So at the moment, there's, there's £36.9 30, million pounds reserves within, within DVA. Um, and, and this information is, is, is published, in, 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 obviously, in, in the accounts uh, for DVA. 17 million of that is set aside for the development of Hyde Bank. So the Hyde Bank is the building of a, an MOT centre and a new depot for our compliance and enforcement teams because with the development of York Street Interchange, the road actually goes through the building that the team are currently in. So we need to relocate that building uh, and, and Hyde Bank uh, is, is the preferred location. So 17 million for Hyde Bank. There is three million pounds there for a new booking system which we're developing at the moment, so that's for how you go about booking your MOT and your driving test. Um, that system has been in place for quite some time and, and, and we're working on replacing it. And there, there is £11 million pounds for equipment that has, that has been set aside. And then there's a £6 million pound contingency which we're required to hold in terms of for working capital and for, for unforeseen events. So um, in the unfortunate circumstances, <coughs> people, to lose a test centre, you would have to have enough reserve to, to replace one of those. The £11 million pounds for the, the city in reserves for vehicle equipment, that is to fund equipment in totality in, in the test hall, not just lifts. So that would be for the equipment for Hyde Bank and also for equipment for any refresh programme that would be required in the future or if there was a uh, proposals around development of a new network of test centres. So are you saying that you have the money to cover... Um, replacing all of the lifts, if that's the case? There's certainly sufficient money within the reserves to cover the cost if, if lifts need to be uh, replaced. Um, and, of course, you know, there is a contingency amount there that gives a degree of flexibility. I think, Chair, it's the distinction between having the monies available, but there wasn't actually plans in place to utilise that, and that's the stage at which we, we were at. Uh, so, yes, the money being set aside because it is uh, prudent, obviously, to do so but not actually having gone to the point of setting up for procurement and, and all of that, but the funds do exist um, to, to enable that to happen. Can, can I just ask how much is added to your reserves each year? 
So it varies, but it's roughly around three to four million pounds over the last number of years um, has been added. Um, the cost, and, and that's largely comes from vehicle testing. So the cost of an MOT test is thirty pounds fifty, which has remained the same probably for about the last twelve, thirteen, fourteen years. Okay. Um, we've always had the minister in, and we had a discussion in relation to obviously she's, she's seeking a report back about the number that maybe could be salvaged through repairs, or whether we're going to have to go down the route of of, of purchase. Um, what discussions have you had with manufacturers for lead-in times for <coughs> delivery for um, these lifts? So maybe if I if I can so that brings you to the whole range of options that are are uh, proposals in that, and we we do really need the uh, external expert uh, opinion around that, which uh, as minister has already described. Um, we're obviously needing to understand what the options look like, uh, how many could be potentially repaired. Um, um, and if they need to be replaced, then what that looks like in terms of do we go to the current uh, supplier or do we go more broadly? So that is the whole kind of scope of, of, of that whole uh, piece of work that is ongoing. Uh, and that's linked then um, to discussions with the supplier around where, where the position we currently find ourselves in. So it's all uh, wrapped up, I guess, in a, in a, in a bigger picture um, and therefore being clear exactly about um, where the supplier is, what's actually involved in all of that, what our options are and whatever. We're, we are still working through that and we will use some of the external expert expertise to help us to, to do that. Um, so the time frames, as Minister um, said earlier, are very difficult to predict because uh, we don't know yet which of the, of the various options will be actually pursued in that space. And obviously in the meantime, while the lifts aren't operating, then there's a greater backlog. And we understand obviously there's also an issue in relation to the six months rule for TECs that creates a further program a problem for you. Um, so time, while you don't want to rush this because you need, you need to get the right information, there's also a, a consequence of not moving forward. We are possible. completely mindful of that uh, and, and you know, you're doing a combination of a lot of things at the same time. Um, so working on the current situation to make sure that uh, customers get the protection they need but absolutely at the same time working as fast as we possibly can to understand well, what are the options for moving ahead and getting back to full-scale operations. We completely understand that in four months' time um, uh, the demand if you like, will completely uh, increase uh, because of the demand at that point plus the four months running out and therefore all what the Minister was discussing with you earlier around the types of options that need to be looked at. That's, so we're looking at procurement and we're looking at other options that might help to help to manage the demand at the same time as giving priority to the customers that we face here and now that need to be actually uh, put through the centres. So there's a multitude of work that is ongoing through Paul and the team to, to make sure we're looking at all of those avenues. Okay, I understand a similar issue has now um, shown itself in the Irish Republic. Is, can you give any information in relation to whether they're the same lifts? Uh, and whether the, the issue is exactly the same as what you're experiencing. Okay, Chair, so whenever this issue um, became more serious, um, I had a discussion with the provider in the south um, to, to inquire, was this an issue that they were witnessing or it's the same supplier, it's the same type of lift. Um, they, at that stage, they had no issues with their lifts. They were being regularly inspected. Um, that was on, on the Friday. On the Monday, I had further contact um, with the provider who, who had said that they had just noticed, now that we had brought it to their attention, they had noticed cracks on a number of their lifts, and that led to the suspension then of the lifts entirely in, in, in the south. Um, I am also aware now that there are um, potentially cracks in some lifts in other European countries. Um, and I am aware that the supplier is now about to make a, a, provide a statement to each of its customers on this particular lift and this particular issue. Um, we haven't received a copy from the, the, the supplier as yet, but I'm aware that one is imminent. So we're, we're at a situation now where this could be a design issue, um, and it could be something then perhaps that the manufacturer then becomes liable for. I think that's we need to explore that issue um, uh, as part of our um, contract negotiations. 
Okay, well, that sort of maybe sheds a, a totally different light on some of the conversations, perhaps, that we have been having. Mm. <coughs> I'll open it up now to other members. Um, Mr. Buchanan. Yep, thank you, thank Chair. You. <coughs> Paul, Julie, uh, just I have a, we've established then that you did, a, correct me if I'm wrong with my terminology or wording, you did not expect a life or a cycle on the lift. The lift was fitted back in 2011, 12, or 13 for a period of time as long as you maintained it correctly and inspected it for whatever the life of the lift was. The life did not have a certain amount of time in your eyes. And I, that, that's certainly my understanding. And, you know, I, 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 my understanding is, as part of our plan preventive maintenance programme, those eight weekly checks and those six monthly checks done by the contractor, that, that would identify defects and if there was a t deterioration in the condition of the lift. Um, as well as those eight weekly and six monthly inspections, we also have the independent inspection done by the insurance uh, inspector every six months on top of those. Again, um, that, in a sense, gives us a, a degree of confidence around the condition of the, of the lifts and the other equipment that they're, they're inspecting at that time. Okay. The report that you're expecting coming forward from an engineer, I presume it's an engineering company, when are you expecting that report to give you advice on whether you're going to do repairs or replacement? So we're expecting an update on that at the start of next week. Um, they've obviously been out looking at the lifts and that will give them a much better sense of where we're currently at and then that will help inform um, what the next steps might look like. So it's like kind of the initial kind of view that we'll get back at that stage and then that will inform what needs to happen next. The company then that uh, maintain the current lifts, okay, there's obviously a contract in place what the maintenance is. What's the definition of maintenance? Because as a crack, I know it's a breakdown, you could define what that is. Is it their responsibility to repair that under that contract? So the contract has two elements to it. It has a maintenance and servicing element um, for all, this is all the equipment, and it also has a reactive repair element. So the contractor, as when they identify a fault with any piece of equipment, they make a recommendation on, how, on what the repair should be or whether that element should be replaced. And the contractor then, um, if, if that's accepted, is then funded for, for that. So there, there, there's, an, there's no incentive for them not to, to, to highlight these issues, um, um, because the, the, in a sense they could carry that work out um, to, to repair it. So based on that, what is the, the, what is the company saying that you should do? Because ultimately you have a contract with them to advise you what to do, so what are they saying to do with the damage or the, the crack? So initially when, this, when the crack was identified um, in November, uh, the recommendation was a, a repair to, to, the, to the lift, um, and the, the company had said to us at that time that they, uh, they, had, they had taken the, lift, the element of the lift apart, they had investigated, they were content that the, 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 a welded repair would be sufficient, um, and, and, and that's what, what we then embarked on in terms of repairs to, to, to lifts. And what's the communication line between, between, since then and now with the company? As in, in what additional support, or have they stepped back a little bit? Because obviously you're bringing in your own people to give you further advice, but have they stepped back, or do you feel that they're giving the support you could, considering this problem is now going your way? Yeah, I, I think whenever we got to this stage on the 27th, where we weren't getting sufficient assurance from the company or, or the contractor in terms of the quality of the repairs that were being done to, to the lifts, um, our engagement has, has moved on to a more contractual basis. Um, I, I, I'm not sure the, who we want to be speaking to in terms of repairs giving past performance. Do you see the two new lifts? And final question: yeah, The two new lifts you've installed, a uh, one in Belfast and one in Londray. New buildings, is that correct? New That's buildings, right. yeah. Is the design of those two new lifts any different from the design of the previous 40, 55? They're a new model. So they they uh, they they, they carry out the same functions, but they're a new model off of that lift. So they are. But are they any stronger? They're still a safe worker loader under the of four four thousand two hundred kilograms. 4.2 tonne? 4.5. 4.5. Yep. Okay, sorry. So, but are, they may be a different model, but are they stronger based on the fact that they had problems in the same location on, on 48 lifts? So, before those lifts went into commission, we, um, DVA, went out and got an independent insurance assessor ourselves to come in and give us um, an assurance around those lifts to make sure they were safe and fit for purpose as they were being supplied to us. Uh, and that was a positive report that came back. 
Yeah, but I suppose the point remains, if you're going to go and purchase new lifts, if that is the plan, <coughs> if you have two new lifts now fitted, it'll be interesting to know are they a stronger lift physically. Yep. Because if you're going forward to buy more, you're buying the same style of the 48 faulty lifts in that, time. I think that's where the external expert comes into yes. it in terms of saying, right, OK, what are our options moving ahead? How fixable <coughs> are the ones we've already got? Uh, um, and if not, what do we do and where do we buy them from and what does that look like in terms of our options? Um, that, that's absolutely part of, of the current conversation. And you wrap and layer around that the, the discussions and the contractual discussions with the supplier. Um, it, there's a long way to go on that uh, to, to actually come out the other side of it. But it's work that we're obviously taking forward. And we're doing that in conjunction with CPD and getting very good advice from them um, to help us to give us the support around that which we need. Paul, if you were to give a, a or Julie, a get, a, well, a time frame and when the MT centres and all that will be back to normal, <coughs> if such a thing as normal, when would you say that is based on what you know now and what you're going to know next week? I think the minister's already answered that earlier, which is um, with, we could just can't speculate about when that time would be. We 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 have the work to do, mm. and that work we will follow that work, and the first stage of that work is the report that comes in at the start of next week. And then we will follow it from there and we'll keep going as quickly and as appropriately as we can till we get to the end of it. And obviously then you have the issues around, OK, we know in four months' time we've bought ourselves a bit of time and that's more than helpful, but we have to have solutions in four months' time. And that brings you into that wider space about the legislative angles that the uh, Minister was also talking <coughs> about. Those are all in place, all working, um, but I can't give you an answer to, to that question at this stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Hilditch. Thanks, Chair. And I think procurement and other jurisdictions have been covered there. I think, so I'll not repeat all that. Uh, basically, last week, then, there was uh, I'd raised questions in relation to the workers' welfare and the risk to workers. And I know Mr Boyden had touched upon the, uh, the customer safety as well. Uh, in hindsight now, and I know the answer was, it was no last week, but in hindsight of what's developed over the past week, would that still be the case in, in your opinion that uh, <coughs> workers were not at risk? I think that um, the, the, the inspections of the lifts that did identify cracks did not suggest that there was any safety issues with the lifts. Um, so I, I, I don't feel that the workers at that time were at risk. Um, I think we've taken a, a precautionary measure to remove those lists um, to ensure we were completely satisfied. Yeah, so is that they something that you've been specifically been told that they weren't at risk, or is that just your well, thoughts? Well, it's on the basis that we were never told that the lifts presented any safety issues. Did you ask? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I take it you want to continue the MOT theme going. I have other questions on your yeah, earlier presentation. Continue. Come back. Will no, come back? Okay. Right. Sorry, just it's on the coal rain uh, licensing situation and for people who work as, <coughs> as drivers, they are in a living as drivers, potentially taxi drivers and uh, uh, lorry drivers, things like that, bus drivers, who potentially in sort of middle aged type meals that they, they fall ill uh, and, and they're out of work for some time and the uh, they then get clearance from their own medical GP or a consultant. That's all forwarded to Coleraine. But it turns out now there's waiting lists of somewhere between three and five months in some cases for getting those people back to work. And obviously those people have to endure difficulties during that time. And also I think we've identified also uh, could lead to mental health stresses as well. Uh, can anything be done to improve that situation? Because I know talking to the people up there, it's out with their hands, it's in someone else's hands, but who, who's making that decision and why is it taking so long to get people back to work who have suffered illness? Okay. Sure, um, th this is a, a particular issue that we are focused on. Um, it, it, so the process that happens is that an applicant applies and to renew their licence. Um, that, that application comes into Coleraine. It's assessed at that stage. If there's a medical condition, they're issued then with a medical questionnaire to complete, which then comes back into Coleraine. We then use the Department of Finance's Occupational Health Service through the, the medical professionals to assess that medical application because my staff are administrative staff and don't have, has, have those skills. So it's passed over to the Occupational Health Service 
We then make an assessment of that application. Now, unfortunately, for some conditions, that may require going to the individual's GP, and in some cases, it may also require them even having to go for the, to the likes of a cardiologist or to a specialist to have tests done before Occupational Health Service can make a recommendation to DVA on that individual's condition. So that process, when it leaves Coleraine and goes into the Occupational Health Service and then goes out into the wider medical field, can sometimes take Take, take, take more time than certainly we would like to be happening. We have introduced a number of measures to try and improve that for, for, for customers and, and to reduce that time frame. Um, we are working with the OHS at the moment, so we have asked them, can they dedicate some medical advisors just for DVA cases so we can speed these turnaround times up? We have been working with our own staff in conjunction with the Driver and Vehicle Licensing Agency in Swansea who have developed, who, who undertake this task for the rest of GB. So they have developed what's called the Medical Wizard, which sort of answers some of those medical questions online. So we're training our staff on to use that. So that should mean less cases are being referred over to OHS. So that will hopefully speed up the turnaround times. And the other thing we're trying to do is we're trying to improve our communication back out to customers. So when you have, you've sent your medical application in, that you know where it is in the system, that it hasn't gone into some black hole within OHS, yeah. and we can't tell I think that's important, because I've met some people in a very distressed state, yes. uh, financial bills waiting to be paid, and, and out of work, your local GP or consultant says you can go back to work, falls into your system, um, five months down the road, they're still... No, I, I appreciate that, and that is something we're working really hard on, trying <clears> to <throat> keep a track of when the information goes into OHS, where is it going after that, and feeding that back on a regular basis to customers to keep them informed. I have to say, we do have a responsibility to ensure people on our roads are safe and medically fit to drive, and that's why we must use the medical professionals to give us that opinion, but we're working closely with them to speed up that turnaround time for customers. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr Boylan. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks very much for the update. Um, just a couple of questions. Uh, Julie, in terms of review, when, when are the report? Sorry. So we'll get an initial report uh, at the start of next week, uh, which will be, I guess, an assessment of what they've found as they've gone round and looked at the lifts, and which will help us to understand what the next steps will be. So we would expect them to do more work after that, but it'll be informed by the work that they're doing this week. OK, and, and I just want to pick up on that point, and also the communication, because I'm still getting texts myself as I sit here, in terms of people asking questions, what to do and everything else. And I know the Chair has referred to that, so communication is a big element at the minute for people. Well, Paul, I just want to go back because I mean, thank you, and, and I want to thank the staff and all we met last week. We got a better understanding when we went out to see for ourselves. We had some understanding those who had been through the MOT test, but mm -hmm. to go out and we, and we talked to staff and we appreciate the work and the pressure and all that been, everybody's been under. But I want to go back. You said you took, we probably took ownership of these six years ago, is that right? In terms of ours. The, the department. We took ownership of the list in May 2013. Right, okay. The, the thing for me is this here, because, um, and this has been alluded to, and we, we had part of the discussion with some of the officials when we were down there. I mean, no matter what it is, there's a shelf life, on, no matter what you buy or what mm -hmm. you do, right? So, and I'm not defending any of those issues. We've seen some of the cracks that are minuscule, but they're, they're still a fault. That's, yes. That's primarily, primarily the issue. But I mean, as, even in the old contract, did nobody look at the original contract to say, you know, was there shelf life, was there a number of lifts, <coughs> or any of that? Was, was there nothing that discussed? And I know it will come out in the report, but I'm just trying to establish it because I know some, some of the people, they're asking questions now in the south because if they have the exact same lifts. Um, was any of that looked previous when you took over the, the lifts itself? Um, was there any conversation about? The, the shelf life for these, these lifts, no? But sure, my understanding is that there is nothing within that contract within that says there is a specific shelf life for a individual lift. That is dependent on the usage of the lift, how well it's maintained and serviced, and, and through that service and maintenance programme, that's when the identification of a lift replacement should really start to materialise. So, and I should say the lifts, just for information, the, the lifts in in the south, um, they, they have... They, were installed in 2009. Yep. Um, uh, however, some of the because they've had a rolling program of new centres open, they do have some lists which are which are younger. Yeah. And, and most of ours were installed. It was late. Day. It was August 
2011, I think, was the first of the lifts, and the last of the lifts yeah. were sort of like middle of July 2012, and a few then in 2013. <coughs> And, and by no means, I'm not challenging the engineering. So I'm not challenging the lift itself, but I did ask the question in terms of um, what would happen. Would there be a catastrophic failure of the lift or not? Now, we've got the, some of the people there we met that day says there is a system there that, that holds the lift in place. I'm not, might, you know. So I mean, I, you know, whilst whilst I'm asked the question, the the primary issue is that there's faults in the lift, and they're now some of them are now ten year old. They couldn't last forever, um, and as part of the process and as part of the review, and, and um, those people are carrying that out. I mean, you know, people have inspected two or three times a year. All of a sudden, all of these lifts have now. So I mean, and that's that mess needs to get out. Yeah. I mean, it, it was missed somewhere. I mean, well, the, yeah, the, the lifts are the moment the oldest lifts are about eight years old. Um, the inspections are not just a couple of times a year; they are every eight weeks and uh, every six months. So there, are, there is quite a good uh, regime in place in terms of inspecting lifts. Um, the question would be um, in terms of the external inspection, why those cracks weren't identified any earlier. No, no, I appreciate it. All I'm saying is the, the, you know, we've seen it without any stress fracture on it or any laden on it. Mm -hmm. I'm sure if there had been a weight on it, it may have been, yep. may have been different. All, all I'm saying is it, even with those checks that period, it should have been maybe picked up a wee bit sooner, but it'll all come out in review. In terms of, obviously, see your reserves, how much are we supposed to hold in reserve? How much are you supposed to hold in reserves? Um, there isn't a set amount that you should hold in reserves. You should only generate reserves for a planned purpose, so you should not generate them for the sake of generating them, um, because you should normally be on full cost recovery, so we're not entitled to create a, create a profit. But at the moment, there's, there's reserves of £36.9 million. Pounds. And, and you said there's what 17 million. Say in terms of the new centres, and what was the plan to upgrade the menu? Was there a plan in place for all of the centres to be upgraded? Or so there was work done about four years ago, looking at what the solution would be um, in terms of the future of the network of MOT centres. As I've said previously, that there has been a growing demand for MOT tests. Uh, our current centres were built about 45 years ago. Um, they, they. Um, we have squeezed, I suppose, as much capacity out of that infrastructure as much as possible. Um, hence, we're building an additional test centre um, at Hyde Bank. But there was a plan then to um, modernise that entire network of test centres. I think that brings you into a wider debate because if you think about the reserves, while well, 36.9 million may seem like a lot, it only really pays for the Hyde Bank uh, test centre. And therefore, if there's to be a network of, of other new centres put into place, and, um, then it would be unlikely that DVA would have sufficient reserves to, to actually do that. And that would bring it into that wider departmental uh, capital budget that you know is under considerable pressure for all the other reasons no, that it is. So it's, it's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a limit to how much DVA can fund itself. Um, and that will get us the one test centre that is, is in, in play at the stage. Once it comes to wider network issues, that's something that Minister will need to consider alongside all the other capital priorities, because at that point, DVA will not be able to self-fund and will need to go to the wider departmental budget to get finance. No, and I appreciate that, because I asked the contact in the context that we're, we're going to face serious difficulties here over a period of time. We're, we're talking about four months. We're talking about we, we have these temporary certificates and all we need to do. But I mean, if if we don't if we don't get a hold of this fairly quickly, besides the money that we have to spend, mm. we're going to have a serious problem trying to address this. I've, I've just two points, two other points. One on taxes, but this and on in terms of the the two year. If we extend it to the two year test, what does it get us out of a situation for a period of time? We're still looking at it because we need to understand the legislative impact of that. And you're weighing up, um, you know, what does the legislation allow you to do? Uh, what is the impact on, on road users, on insurance companies? There will be other people who will have views about whether we should do that change or not. So we're at very early doors, really, in terms of considering <coughs> that option. Uh, it impacts on. Um, the, the scale and the demand that will go through the centres dramatically, because you're only going through uh, every other year rather than, than no, no, no. Years. And so there's a lot of things I'll take that on board the road safety, on. all the elements yeah. that were mentioned with the minister. All I'm saying to you, 
you know, we, we need to get hold. Off these reviews are all over, you'll soon see we'll, we'll need to get hold of. I asked in that context yeah. only. And, and then that it'll be down to the business plan and all of that that <coughs> comes with it. Yeah. Procurement process, which has been asked already. I understand that now. Um, I appreciate your answers. The, the other, just the other issue I want to bring up, because it's been raised again now that we're back, the taxis industry, Paul, I mean, <laughs> um, I've received a number of emails. I mean, we've been brought up with the minister today. There's still issues that are ongoing. I mean, would you like to respond in terms of what's happening within the city or how, how we address some of the issues that have been brought up to us? Uh, I'm sure it's been brought up yourselves in relation to the rollout of the whole Taxis Act after yes. a substantial period of time, you know? So the responsibility of DVA is to, to regulate the taxi industry in accordance with whatever legislation <coughs> the Minister has in place at that time. Um, so for DVA, our, I, I suppose our, our biggest challenge um, in terms of the taxi industry uh, is how we ensure that that two-mile zone that exists within Belfast mm. where, um, uh, where we, we witness a degree of um, what we would term illegal picking up from um, classes of taxis that are not permitted to do so. Um, so we, we work closely with the industry to try and address that issue. It's a very difficult issue to address um, for us to... Um, for us to detect someone doing that and take it to the stage of <coughs> either issuing a fixed penalty or um, for taking that or prosecuting a driver, we have to have a member of our staff has to actually uh, get into the taxi um, unidentified, take the taxi journey and take receipt of the money um, to show it's, that, that, that there's been a, 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 a pay and reward within that. Um, and then that then can lead to a, a fixed penalty or a prosecution. You can understand that that is quite a time-consuming process for one detection. Whenever on a, a Friday, Saturday night, uh, an afternoon during the week, that this can be happening quite a bit. So it is very, very challenging to enforce that two-mile zone. Um, that's the biggest challenge that we're facing, and that's probably the, the biggest criticism, criticism we would get from some of the classes of taxis that we're not doing enough. But it is it, it, it is a very challenging issue to, to, to address. No, I appreciate the answer. It, it, the, the members, if they're not familiar, they will become very familiar with the taxis legislation <laughs> over the period of time. I, I just, you know, but I appreciate your that's response. Sure. To it, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Mr Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, just following up on this point in terms of that legislation around that, would there be plans to reform that legislation to allow easier enforcement of those issues? I think the Minister has given a commitment that she would look at the legislation around taxis. And, yes. and, and I, th I think in terms of looking at the legislation, the, you know, the lessons, from my view, learned from the last legislation is that we need to look at how that legislation is applied on the ground, what are the practical outworkings of it, and to ensure that it is actually enforceable, whatever is put in place. Yeah. Because there's a safety issue around this, because if you have taxis which are contravening legislation, you potentially have people picking up who aren't licensed taxis, who don't have necessary insurances in place, who are charging consumers, you know, um, you know, way above what the fee is, where there's licensed taxis who are, you know, working hard for a living, who are then the, the situations occurring. Yeah, what, what, what I would say, Chair, is the illegal picking up that we witness tends to be done by licensed taxi drivers who are picking up outside their licensing conditions. So they are not permitted to pick up within the two-mile zone, but continue to do so. Uh, it is hugely <coughs> resource-intensive and try to address that issue. Uh, and I understand that it, it, the, the frustration it creates for parts of the taxi industry. For me, my preference would be our priority is focused on illegal taxis, yeah. because that's where the safety issue is. Um, is, is, and that's a particular issue in, in the night economy, especially Friday, Saturday nights. Uh, and that's where we would like to have more of our focus on ensuring taxi, the, the taxis that are picking people are licensed and, and, and lawful to do so. Thank you. Uh, just in relation to the MOT situation, um, and thank you for coming along and for your update. Obviously, most of us probably be concerned to hear that this is probably a, potentially a wider issue uh, across <coughs> Europe, and more information on that in due course would, would be useful. Um, in terms of the safety issues which have been picked up upon some of the members, there was discussion around the involvement of the health and safety executive and just wanted to see if there's any more information in terms of what is the involvement of the health and safety executive in relation to this. Okay, so whenever this issue um, um, materialised, was, was, I suppose it was round about, forgive me for my dates because the last three weeks have, have blurred um, greatly for me, um, um, because it, it does seem to have been just one long day. Um, 
the engagement with the Health and Safety Agency was whenever we were getting concerned with the, some of the repairs that were happening um, and some of the uh, feedback we were getting from staff. So we engaged with the Health and Safety Executive to keep them fully informed of what was happening. Um, and I wrote to them, I think it was on the 25th of January, to tell to set out what we were doing in terms of we were putting a regime in which was um, inspect, repair, re-inspect the lift before it went into operation to protect our staff and our customers. We were keeping them informed throughout this whole process. And is there an ongoing engagement with from, from themselves now that you've proactively reported it to them? Or? I think that at this stage, um, given that the lifts have been suspended, yes. the health and safety executive um, are no aren't, aren't involved. But if there are any further developments, we always keep that communication open uh, with, with the health and safety executive. In terms of the NCT situation down south, um, my understanding is that they're conducting the tests, but without one element of it involving the lift. Mm. And just want to view in relation to that because. Um, hopefully, the independent inspection is going to come back next week. We don't know uh, to, to allow some of these lifts to be used, but the reality is that some of them, I would suspect, from the independent inspection may say that they can't be used, and there's going to be a whole process here in relation to procuring and installing lifts, which is going to take, I would suspect, months mm -hmm. uh, to do that, to do it correctly and stuff like that. So just understand what the situation is down there, and also understood that they've also started doing some full tests as well. So. Yes. So. The process uh, in the south is that they're still conducting the first part of the test, and when it gets the the under the visual inspection on the underside of the vehicle, they are has suspended the test at that part, um, and therefore they're not able to issue a a test certificate to a vehicle. Okay. Um, they are bringing those vehicles back at a later date, yet to be determined, to then go through that part of the test. Um, I I'm not sure how that fits with the directive. Given that you then have a vehicle that's on the road without a, a, any sort of a test certificate at all, yes. uh, they don't. The, the process that we have put in place in, in terms of a temporary exemption certificate is allowing us to extend the one-year MOT by four months. In the south, because they do their test every two years, they don't have any latitude to extend that because that's the minimum amount the directive allows you to do. Right. So I'm unclear of how they're how their vehicles are on the road without <coughs> certificate at the moment. In terms of doing some of the tests, uh, uh, moving back, as I said earlier, they have had a programme where they have replaced some of their test centres at a later date, and therefore some of their lifts are younger. I understand that they have um, between six and eight lifts up and running um, at their centres. They have just, um, in the process of installing, 13 new lifts, which they have purchased from the same contractor, uh, and they will be up and running this week. And they are now looking at those lifts with cracks and assessing, like we are, whether or not those lifts can be repaired or whether or not those lifts need replaced. So that's very quick for the 13 lifts to... to they had them already. Right. They, so they, were, they had plans to, to start refreshing some of their stock <coughs> at a later date. Okay. The contractor was aware of this and, it, and they had 13 lifts sitting in stock ready for them to call upon as and when they needed them. Very similar to the two lifts that we had in that same yeah. position here. Okay. And just in terms of the, the cost, if, if eventually the new lifts have to be purchased, obviously there's a capital cost associated with that. Is there an opportunity for that to be subject to an insurance claim or for a compensation claim? Just the, the, the default to go to the public person in relation to this is something I don't think you know we should be really. I think that's all subject to the conversations that we're having with yes. the contractor about why we're in the position we are and solutions to resolve it. So that's all wrapped up in that yeah. and, and it'll, it'll follow through and as it does. Um, just talking about the financial situation and the first day brief for the Minister it outlined that a further investment of £120 million <coughs> is required to bring the DVA test centres in line with the European Roadworthiness Directive and um, there was also information in relation to the uh, diesel emissions test mm -hmm. and just an update in terms of I understand this is here and now we're dealing with the MOT situation, but these are these are long-term strategic things that we need to deal with, and they were discussed pre previously in the media and stuff around the diesel emission tests and what the plans are to sort of try to address that. And the sort of I think if I start on the yeah. on the strategic yeah. bit on okay. the, on, the, on the kind of plan, it's it's a bit like the the, the conversation around mm -hmm. we we need to look to see what our network of test centres look like, um, where that would um, where they would be located, how that would be followed through. 
um, we know we've only really got the reserves for the one that is in Hyde Bank, and therefore it becomes part of that uh, strategic conversation about how we might uh, need to use our DFI broader funds and what that looks like in terms of, because you're fully, fully aware of, of the, the, the significant um, priorities, other priorities that there may be on that budget. Um, but that doesn't mean that nothing's happening on diesel, and Paul maybe can yes, explain what, what's, what's happening at the moment. So at the moment, we still conduct a full emissions test for petrol vehicles. Um, with all vehicles. Um, for diesel, uh, there is a, a, an emissions test carried out on the heavy goods vehicles, on buses and on vans over 3,500 kilograms. On cars and light vans, we carry out a visual inspection um, on, on the vehicles when they turn up for tests. And in May last year, we introduced them. Uh, 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 we now, as a testable item, use what's called the, the, the mill light. And, it would, and if, it's, if it's visible on the, on, the, on the dice, that would give an indication that there's a problem with the emissions within the vehicle. If that light is on, then the vehicle fails its, 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 test for an, its, its MOT test on, on the grounds of emissions. And what is the long-term plan to try to be able to introduce these diesel emission tests that's in line with the right? So it's back to um, sites. it's back to the sites exactly. It's it's again back to sort of health and safety issues around making sure that we can actually test safely, um, and that's what's behind all of that. Which means that we need to bring that conversation for. Uh, test centres in alongside, well, how do we fund all the other capital requirements? And that's obviously something we need to take through with the, the new minister. So I think that would be important because we talked earlier with the minister about air quality and stuff like that, yes. and this feeds into that. So. Very much so. But thank you. Skelly. Thank you, Chair, and um, thanks for your presentation. I think, Julie, it was you that said that the MOT cost hadn't gone up in 12 to 13 years and was currently around £30, and you also meant, mentioned an obligation about full cost recovery. So what would full cost recovery look like in terms of an MOT cost? So at the moment, it, as I said, it's £30.50 for, for an MOT. If we did not have to invest in the future infrastructure that's required, and that's one of the reasons where we've been accumulating a degree of reserves, then the cost of an MOT would probably be slightly less than what it is now. Um, and, and, you know, so for every pound an MOT uh, we charge for an MOT, it's roughly a million pounds in revenue that comes in a year. So you know, we were generating about three to four million pounds a year. So. The full cost recovery in rough terms for an MOT is probably around about £27, £28, pounds, but that a bit above that allows us to build up reserves for future investment in the MOT system. And full cost recovery in the broader sense in the public sector does allow you to set that money aside for uh, otherwise you're going to hit a problem that, you know, whenever you yeah. need to make those investments. So it's completely normal that you would factor into your to your uh, fees that yeah. you've got that uh, buffer that will allow it will all be utilised and it has to be set aside and uh, as Paul's already described for particular purposes, but you are allowed to make sure that you're getting those funds in to make those investments on a periodic basis. That's all part of the norm. That's fine. And the other bit, Chair, that I'm interested in was around uh, the earlier comments by Mr Hilditch around the waiting times. Um, you, you did say that you were addressing this and taking it, but you know, that doesn't give as much detail around uh, and it doesn't give much comfort to those people who are waiting a long time. I'd also be interested in hearing a wee bit more around your service to uh, disabled, car, uh, disabled users or drivers, um, particularly those who have had an illness or an injury. And I, I know that there used to be specific tests uh, for drivers who have had uh, an injury. Uh, I just wonder what your waiting times are like. Are you up to speed in all of that? Or are there any particular issues that need to be addressed? Okay, Church, uh, in terms of, of waiting times, as I said, we took a number of measures last year. Last year, we, what we witnessed was that we tend to always get that spike in demand around January to, to May, and in, in previous years, we've, waiting times tend to go out during that period. We've managed to keep them to a manageable level. What happened last year was that tipped slightly above what was an acceptable level. And as a consequence, there was a, there was some media reporting on it. When we look back at the trend then of bookings, once that media report came out, we had a huge spike in applications. We witnessed what was almost like panic booking. The people who we were sending reminders out, uh, whose MOT was due in seven or eight weeks' time, who maybe wouldn't have normally booked 
two or three weeks out, were then booking as soon as they were getting a reminder, which was then which then accentuated the problem. So we had quite a difficult time to try and bring those waiting times back down. And as I said, we've done that through a number of measures. In terms of we 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 went to a period of Sunday opening. We opened all the bank holidays dur during the summer. Um, and we also then recruited some additional um, casual staff to come in and, 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 and assist us with those tests. In preparation then for this year, what we've done was we've increased the number of vehicle examiners we employ permanently. So we, we've employed about uh, between about 35 and 40 additional vehicle examiners were brought in, and they've been trained and they're in place um, for, for, for this year. Um, we also then moved to some Sunday opening at the very start of this year, so that we would stay ahead of the issue rather than uh, running it close. Um, so, unfortunately, you know, we, we find ourselves talking about the disruption in the MOT service. I, 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 and it would be easy for me to say this now, but I was fairly confident that we were on top of the waiting time issue and we wouldn't have seen a repeat this year and because of those measures we, we, we had taken. In terms of, of, of disabled drivers, um, we work very closely with Disability Action in terms of arranging those tests, uh, um, particular tests, um, for those affected dr drivers. Um, I'm not aware that there are any significant issues around waiting times. <coughs> we work very c closely with, with, with Disability Action in terms of uh, disabled drivers who come to our test centres to have the test, either a driving test or a vehicle test. Then we have arrangements at the centre to facilitate that for them. So we'll either, if it's a vehicle test, we'll either take the vehicle through with them, or we have arrangements on how that test can be adjusted to suit their requirements, <coughs> and the same as part of the driving test. And the, the occupational health issue and that, that waiting time, have there been any additional uh, resources put into that to allow the medical reports to be examined and signed off? So we have been working, so we have done, in, in respect of resources in, in two areas, we have a, our own medical team that mm -hmm. look after medical Certainly. applications, so we have strengthened that team um, and done some work around, um, as I say, working with the driver and vehicle licence in Swansea in terms of some software to help um, process those applications quicker and filter them better, but we have also then been engaging very closely with the Occupational Health Service in terms of getting assurance from them that they have got sufficient resources to manage the throughput that we are asking them to manage, and for asking them to set up and um, give us some dedicated medical advisors that will deal only with DVA cases until we get that level, of, until their level of, of, of backlog is reduced. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr Beggs. <coughs> Again, thanks for your, your update so far. Um, and we need to all, I think, concentrate on, <coughs> on what we can do urgently to, to fend off this growing problem that's coming in about four, four months' time or less than that. Uh, but you mentioned EU directives being one of the factors uh, that is restricting what can and cannot be done. I appreciate we're still uh, in the transition phase. So my question is, is this an area that's still, uh, uh, that we can actually legislate for? Or is this an area which ultimately the new two or four month committee will decide upon? Is this something that this assembly can legislate for? It's been transposed into UK law so at this point, so any changes then would have to come back through uh, in that way. And then you're into how do, as it affects all le EU legislation, do you change it locally and what would that mean in terms of being able to uh, trade and all of that? So at the moment, it's the law that applies, uh, and that's the law we have to abide by. I understand that, yeah. but can a law change at Westminster give us flexibility, or is this something that we are uh, restricted in what we can do by the Brexit deal that's gone through? Yeah, a lot of that, I think, I think it becomes in the unknown category uh, because uh, we don't know quite how all that's going to work through. Okay. Um, uh, turning then to the, the, the problems of the lifts uh, that we face, um, and I've seen that you know there's a procurement underway according to your investment strategy report for Hyde Bank and it's uh, due to uh, procurement runs from July last year and, and completed in June, that's the schedule. So it actually is quite important that we get our procurement right and that's just for one centre and then there's planned to be this complete revamp of all centres um, a year or so later. So the question is, that I have in terms of that one specific procurement at Hyde Bank does it have built into it uh, a life cycle in terms of the, uh, these lifts so that you know what you're buying uh, and you know when the lift will be due for renewal? Because to me, uh, it's not just the vertical up and down, 
there is that sideways sh shaking movement which tests the, the suspension and the, and the steering at the front, uh, and that is putting a cyber stress on the pivot point, which I suspect is the cause of the, the cracks. Uh, so is there a cycle limit that's going, that has, has been specified in the procurement process so we know what we're buying? Okay, so the procurement process that's, that is underway is to appoint a construction company who will build um, the actual facility at Hyde Bank. We then would need to, uh, and, the, and then the second element of that is the equipment that will be put into to, to, to that building. I think in terms of, I think it, 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 and it's something we will test um, with the contractor, I think it will be very difficult to put a definitive time frame on how long a lift would need to be replaced by, um, but that's something we'll certainly tease out with them. I suppose it, it's a bit like saying, you know, how old should a car be until you replace it? Sorry, my question was about cycles, metal yeah. stresses, depending on the number of times it bends. So, uh, yeah. you know, is there a method of recording uh, through the test like system? There, there, there is a way of, of knowing how many cycles yeah. the, the lift is being put through, but I think that's certainly now, mm -hmm. given our experience, something we will want to tease out a little bit more with equipment manufacturer. Um, I, th I think we'll also want to tease out a little bit with, and I'm going to sort of contradict myself a little bit here, but at least give us a time frame of when a lift going through X number of cycles would need to be replaced. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and again, the, in terms of the, um, the wider refurbishment, the £120, £140 million pound contract, but, but you've indicated that you actually only have £11 million pounds extra built into your resources at the minute for flexible expenditure on equipment. Yes, that amount is estimated. That would cover if we. Ha so that amount is, is, I suppose, is being built up on the basis that if we were to have X number of new centres, this is the amount of money you would need to put the equipment into those new centres. We've, we've learnt of the, the pressures on the roads immediately beforehand, the water system, mm -hmm. uh, sewage system, etc. Why has uh, the MOT? Uh, costs not at least increased with inflation for 13 years? To build up a reserve to renew the centres, which everybody knew would have been coming? Uh, I, I think you, the issue is that would, the normal practice would be that whenever you're doing such a significant capital investment, that you would then, because DVA is slightly different than other public sector bodies, certainly within central government, is because it's a trading fund, it can actually borrow um, and now borrowing them would be paid, paid back over the life of the asset. So to accumulate, say, £100 million pounds for that investment over a very short period of time would require a, a, a significant hike in an MOT fee. The normal practice would be to borrow the money and then repay that okay. through the fee over the life of that asset. And does that borrowing go against public expenditure limits? It does, because it's, so it it's still public, se it's public sector that borrowing. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Members, any other questions in relation to this? Okay, just a couple of tidy up questions, if that's okay. Um, I was, a query was raised with me in relation to the testing of e cars, and I was just wondering whether there had, are there any adaptations which were required in the centres in order to be able to give them a full test. I'm thinking particularly around the brake system. Yes, um, so. You know, Chair, you can appreciate that the developments of new vehicles, um, our, our test centres have been designed. Um, probably for, for vehicles that have been on the road for quite some time now. So whenever you get a new type of vehicle that's coming through the test centre, sometimes there's a, there are teething issues about how it's used in the test. So there, I am aware there was an issue with electric vehicles on how they come out of the rollers, the brake rollers. Um, so there has been a fix done to the brake roller system. Um, so the contractor was asked to, to come up with a solution to that, and that has been implemented. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, there was also a query raised last week, and we were looking for clarification around it as to whether or not it was still possible to book an MOT online. Yes. It is. Yes, and, and I knew the question would come up, and I sat last night and tried to book one myself, myself, and it works fine. <laughs> and okay, thank you. And obviously, there's been quite a, a long discussion in relation to Hyde Bank, and I'm guessing the committee would appreciate probably more information in relation to that, particularly plans and so on, too, yeah, if you were able do. to furnish us with that. Just a quick question, if I may. Uh, yes. And, and when we had a visit to Translink, we saw their wonderful uh, system, new building that they have with their uh, specialist pits and jacks for lifting buses. 
but yet they have to transfer all their buses, ignore all their pits during a test, and go to the under pressure MOT centres. What would need to be done so that excellent public facilities like that could be used to improve the number of vehicles that can receive an MOT in the other DVA centres? I mean, can a, can a DVA official go to the likes of Ulster Bus and inspect the vehicles there? So the, at the moment, the legislation uh, states that the MOT must happen uh, on a departmental site. Um, so at the moment, the legislation doesn't allow um, examiners to go to other um, locations to conduct the test. Um, there are other issues around that on an operational level in terms of how you get that data back and into the system, but those are not insurmountable. But there are there is a legislative issue on that. At the and how is it to change the legislation if we knew? Because we are in. Yeah. Quite a crisis at and the it's back to isn't it the, the contingency options and, and all the full exploration of everything that we can possibly do and that's certainly something that we will continue to look at. I think it will be it will be quite complex to do something like that is our early advice on it but we are exploring and as the minister said we are exploring all possible options to try and make sure we've got both contingency in place and then that the centres are up and running as soon as possible. Okay and really sort of on that was really my final question um, was in relation to the number of MOTs which are currently being carried out and I know that you were you were prioritising four-year-old vehicles and we're looking now at three-year-old vans um, and taking those through HGV lanes in addition obviously to um, the opening up of, of the additional lifts. Um, can you give an, uh, an idea really of, of what percentage now that you're now operating at? So at the moment, if I um, the latest figures I can think of in terms of cars that we're processing, so we're processing about, about I think on Monday we're processing around about 1,500 cars, where normally we would be doing about 3,500 cars. Okay. Um, overall, since this issue arose on the 21st of July, we have conducted around 24,500 tests. And there is also discussion about in, um, increased hours. Has that taken place, or are we still in the process of doing that? So we have moved to Sunday opening, and, and actually um, last Sunday we opened at, 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 at a number of centres and opened them longer than what they would normally be open on a Sunday. We are engaging with TUS at the moment in terms of alternative shift patterns and evening openings. So we are engaging. Still opportunities for that to happen. Yeah, we are we're engaging with TUS to st and, and, and staff on, on that particular issue. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much for your time this morning. Okay. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The committee would appreciate um, receiving regular updates with regards to this, the ongoing situation. Yep. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, moving then quickly to our, our final briefing, which is in relation to the SR 2017-34, which is the roads miscellaneous provisions. Um, some members had raised concerns in relation to this rule. We have departmental officials um, coming in now. Uh, we have Deidre Gallagher, who's the Transport Legislation Branch for the Department, and Mr Stephen Hughes, Head of Traffic and in Engineering Policy. Um, Members are, are content just to. I know that this was raised by Mr. Muir yeah. and um, Mr. Yeah. Hildage and Mr. Beggs, I think. Um, so, if you'd like to make comment, you're very welcome um, to committee. Um, and if you'd like to make comment just in relation to this particular rule. Yes, um, this um, statutory rule actually came to the committee on the 30th of November 2016. And the committee was content to note uh, the statutory rule and agree it. And um, after representations were made to the then minister, um, we agreed that it should commence at a later date. The committee had been informed the date was the 23rd of January 2017 for commencement. The minister agreed it should be a later date, September 2017. So a DALO letter was issued to the committee on that um, on the 25th of January 2017 advising the committee that the SR that they had already agreed would commence at a later date. Okay. Mr Muir, yeah. you had raised concerns in relation to this and the impact of it. Yeah. So officials will probably be aware of the concerns that have been raised subject to the commencement of the order. They're quite significant. Uh, there was an APG meeting on Tuesday of this week in relation to sport and physical recreation and the concerns have been highlighted around that. that um, resulting in very significant increased costs for organisers of events. Events are also being cancelled as a result of it. 
um, as understand the legislation is also being applied to road races in terms of vehicles and stuff like that, which previously wasn't the case. Um, but whereby the legislation doesn't apply to other issues such as public processions and stuff like that. And it's just the understanding from the officials of what the issues that they have encountered since the commencement of the legislation and also from their perspective what the rationale was behind the actual starting this legislation in the first place. Because what it's done is that there's been lots of charitable events uh, promoting physical activity that have been cancelled as a result of this and uh, so it's having a real significant impact. Uh, the, the, the rationale behind, behind the miscellaneous provisions originally was um, events were previously held, been, been held under the good grace of the, the police. The police service were providing a facility to, to, to permit events to be held on the road um, using powers that they weren't, felt weren't wholly um, appropriate to the, to the event. Um, they're more security related um, events, so the, the miscellaneous provisions were, were, were developed to allow special events to be held on the road under a proper legal framework. Um, what's happened is, you know, what, where, where, the, where the impact is on, on the event organisers or service, but um, previously the police were monitoring traffic and controlling traffic on the road. Um, they have, they are now no longer responsible for that and the responsibility has been handed over to the event organisers. Yes. And that's basically yeah, the, the, the main impact. The, the, yeah, that's the major problem. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And you're aware. Effectively, yeah. there's no. Well, we, we know, there's no, no. No new. What what's happened is that the the, the burden for mm. keeping the traffic public safe on the road has transferred from the, the, the police over to the event organizer. Yeah, and significant costs associated with that. So yeah. yours are aware, obviously, of the concerns that have been expressed no, in relation. Really. To well, the legislation. I think we. I, I met with um, a previous um, committee or the That's all-party the working group. Yeah. It was heard by Mike Nesbitt at the time last year. Yes. So we are we are well aware of the the concerns coming from, you know, the sports sporting bodies, yeah. the councils, and some event organisers. Yes. And we we were already committed to doing a review of okay. of the impact of the legislation. Have you started uh, that review yet? Or? Well, I've started the preliminary work, so I have. Um, and right. The next step, we'll, we'll be going out and talking to, um, or seeking seeking data from councils. We'll we're preparing about a questionnaire to go out on you know social media and things. You got to get as much data back as we can. I, I do welcome the fact that you've started the preliminary work on the review. The issue is that this legislation has been in place for three years. These issues have been well known and well publicised, and I would expect the review to have been at a much higher, advanced stage. You know, because th th this what's what's happened to this is the impact of this is significant. You know, when government should be enabling people with this legislation, the costs associated with it being passed on to bodies is, you know, it's resulting in council events. Yeah, well, it was, there was a bit of a slow start, to be honest. You know, the first the first events were being held uh, sort of early to mid 2018. So basically, we're looking at the middle of last year before you had a full year of events. Um, so the the view was, you know, let this bed and see what see see what the impact is on the ground, and um, then review it after a year based on a year's data. Obviously, we moved on a bit, but you know, we're still we're working on the basis that you know we'll look at the year and a half data, you know, instead of the, the years, you know. Yeah. So, what's the time scale for the completion of the review? The, the, I don't have a time scale at the moment. Yeah. Um, I, you know, it's it's on my desk currently, so it is um, to push forward. Obviously, uh, we'll, well, if a questionnaire goes out, we'll have to allow eight weeks, twelve weeks, you know, for you know to get data back. We'll also have to go out and talk to councils and get data back for them as well. We'll have to talk to the local police and, and whatever. So, there's, there's there's quite a bit of work to gather enough data, you know, to do them a, a, a robust review. You know, um, and, uh, we're hoping that we're looking hopefully to, towards the summer. You know, to, to get some sort of output. You know, it um, could inform. You know, the, also, where the some minister. councils are implementing it different than others, so some are not sort of um, going that? for the full spirit of the legislation. I don't know if you're viewing that. There's an implication. Well, we, 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 I, I can't answer for the councils to be honest. All, all I can do is ask the question. So there was guidance produced on the legislation yeah. for councils, you know, and um, although you know, there's two, there's the legislation which they have to comply with, and then there's the guidance which is you know good practice, whatever, and they're they're best to, to, to follow that, you know. Um, what you'd expect. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hildage. Thanks, Chair, and I don't think there's much more to say on 
welcome that you're having the review. I think we're, I think you're at the last meeting I was at. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm a member of the All Party yes, Sports Group. That's, that's correct, indeed. Uh, it's, it's just strange, obviously, that one part of government wants people to yes. adopt a lifestyle of, you know, sort of fitness and well-being, and another part of government because of the burden, is the word you used, is closing down that sort of aspect of life, because people just can't afford, most of them are charitable events mm -hmm. like marathons, half marathons, 5Ks and various things, hill climbs, and it's just, it's, it's two different signals being sent out by government really as to, as to what should happen, and I do welcome the review. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Mr Beggs. <coughs> yeah, uh, I also welcome the review, but in, in taking the review forward, I would hope that you would be looking at what can be done to mitigate now, I am aware, for example, that councils do provide grant, like grave to grant funding for training of marshals to uh, direct traffic and assist on the road, but the, the, the expensive bit that still sits there is uh, a road traffic uh, expert to uh, come up with a, a flow arrangement that, that operates, and then the cost of providing signage. So. Um, I just would ask that you would look at what mitigation could be, could be uh, uh, done to, to improve that and reduce the burden. Um, getting a road traffic plan in particular, you know, you're into a very uh, a specialist field and it can be very expensive, uh, very high early rate. Yes. Um, you know, whether that someone within a department could provide that bit of advice uh, to via councils, I, I don't know. It just needs to be looked at. What can be done? Keep the cost down so that community events can still happen. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Boylan. Thanks, Chair. I'm sitting listening. Um, thank you very much for the explanation, Stephen. I I can clearly understand what exactly was happening here. I don't know where the where the rule itself when it was passed. That was the intention because that could have, should have come up through the process. In in relation to how like even ourselves, I mean, I know myself that. A lot of council events and council uh, groups, sports groups, were definitely bounced with all of this in terms of cost. I come, I'm, I'm just saying from my experience of it, um, and I know members are asking about mitigations and all. I mean, j just in, in terms of the whole rollout of the process, could somebody explain to me? Because it seems to me, I'm not saying they were missed, but certainly the interpretation, whilst it may have been good intent, it has impact on a lot of charity groups out there and 5K runs and. It's a big issue of road bolts down our own way. I definitely, the groups were definitely weren't happy with us here. Um, and it's not to say they won't play their part, but it's certainly been a financial burden. And it has led to some of the events actually being shut down and maybe taken into a different park or, or council owned facility. And, and, and I don't think you now that would have been the full intention or, or the backing of the members of a committee to, if they knew exactly that would be the rollout. I'm not saying they didn't understand it or not. But I understand we usually come from in terms of bringing the rule forward, but just a wee bit in relation to the whole process in terms of... Well, yeah. the 2010 Act, um, obviously it, it was the will of the Assembly that some of the powers would be transferred to mm -hmm. local uh, councils. And from the 2010 Act, there have been some ongoing consultation with councils, isn't that right, and um, council representatives in regard to guidance, <coughs> etc. And... Um, in 2016, the then Minister took the decision to commence the outstanding provisions of the 2010 Act, including <coughs> the special events. And there was representations made, so he um, decided then to delay the commencement until September 2017, again to allow councils to add in their own arrangements, etc. as well. So the rule was made in January, but wasn't commenced until September. No, 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 I appreciate that. but. Are you saying the rule then was putting an onus on council to deal with whatever? Because ultimately, the rollout of the it's, it's the whole rolling out and it's the impact on the cost and the burden. I mean, you're saying to me that councils fully understood that that was what was going to be the intent of the actual rule itself when they come forward. Yes, well, there have been ongoing Stephen, can I indicate? Consultation with councils and guidance produced. The act, the act itself was you know, fully consulted no, on. No, 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 no,
you know, I, I keep coming back to the, the, the fundamental problem. You know, the, 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 the police, were, the police were withdrawn. You know, the, the, the presence of a police officer, which was you know providing the, you know, the traffic cam, the traffic management, you know, on, at the side of the road. You know, um, ultimately the the, the, the legislation is written in a way to provide the uh, traffic management to protect the travelling public. You know, people who are using the road and people who are on the road. You know, and you know. The, the, the safety of the public has to has to be first and foremost to no, you. Know, uh, no, no, Stephen, and I appreciate all of that, and I don't think any of the members would dispute that. The the impact of it has been on all of these groups, the payment, the way they roll it out, and I don't know where the. I'm just asking myself if I was sitting on council, in a council chamber, and that was going to happen to ten groups that I was supporting, back in my own constituency, well then. I certainly would have been out looking for exemptions or how we're going to pay for it. Is it through rates or, yeah. or whatever way it was? I mean, it has seriously impacted mm. those groups and how they operate. That's all I'm saying. To you. And I mean, I would support obviously this review ongoing. I am um, knowing legislation as I do. I mean, I would have to be asking for amendment or exemption or some way of looking to roll this out or, or working with councils and where whoever's going to foot the. Cost or how we we'll roll it out again, I would certainly all those things. I'd certainly have a proper look at it in terms of review and how we would address those problems. Obviously, there's nothing that we can do at this stage. In absolutely to not. No, I mean that's yeah, absolutely. But it may be something that officials might be able to take on board during the review, um, and perhaps when we come back to committee again at a further stage absolutely. for a discussion. Well, I, I'm fairly confident we'll get most of the, most of these views with, with the review. So uh, right. you know, I just uh, want to highlight. Yeah, absolutely. They're, they're all thank under you. consideration. Okay, thank you. And no other member has indicated. So can I, I thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So agreed that we note, members. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank then moving on to item nine, which is important legislation in consideration of the examiner of statutory rules report, which is tabled at page thirteen. And this is the first report of the session for 2019-20. The examiner has no issues with any of the subordinate rules uh, that have been considered by the committee at the meetings which we held on the 21st and 22nd of January. Um, there were a number, obviously, that the committee had raised issues with or concerns in relation to, and um, the examiner has no comment to make on that. So, if you're content to note the statutory rule, yeah. thank you very yeah. much. Moving then to our draft um, forward work um, programme, um, <coughs> the process of being developed over the next number of weeks. And I'll ask Cathy just to take us through that very quickly. Yeah. Uh, next week, we have three briefings that are happening. Uh, one on road safety, one on transport policy and public transport, and one on briefing on Brexit. And then the following week, on the 19th of February, we have um, water and drainage policy, regional planning and strategic planning, and we have a briefing on the budget because the supply resolution is scheduled up for the 24th, budget first day, uh, number one and number two, 24th and 25th of February. So we'll have a briefing on the budget before that. Um, and then the following week, the 26th, we originally planned to have rivers and flooding and roads procurement. We think roads procurement is not going ahead now. Um, we're going to look and see if we can bring in Des McKibben, who is our um, researcher, to do a briefing on what research services can offer us. Um, we're also thinking of going to the control centre that day because it might be a shorter meeting and go down and see if it's down at Sydney where they have the winter service. Winter service, and they also have the, um, all the cameras for the okay. roads. And then the following week, the 4th of March, we have a briefing on TransLink. Um, NI Water can't do and Waterways Ireland can't do. <coughs> so we're th looking at maybe bringing in community transport, which is great to have today. Yeah, yeah. And then week commence or Wednesday, the 11th of March, we hope to have our induction day um, down at Belfast Sewage Treatment Works down at Dunkery Street. They have a heritage centre there and we can have our uh, induction day there. We have scheduled for Sarah Fanning, Chief Executive of NI Water, to brief us that day. So if you are agreeable, we were thinking of having Sarah in first for a briefing and then so have that meeting and then go on to our strategic planning meeting, um, which would be in closed session. Yeah. Mr. Ray. Yeah, just clarifying, I'm not sure if it's included under drainage or flooding, but uh, from reading the brief again, I mean, I picked up this business, 33 re reservoirs are in poor or very poor conditions. And I think we need to keep pressure on mm -hmm. the system to get, and there's no enforcement action that anybody can do at present. Mm -hmm. Do we need to, 
uh, simply write to the corresponding committee and ask them to, you know, encourage their minister to rewrite to the to the minister of uh, the era. I, I just, we, I think we need to pursue that we, issue. What we need to follow up on is in really, is to where the transfer functions is. So yeah, if we yeah. can get clarity in relation yeah. to that, then we can maybe start to look to action on that. Yeah, but just no, a second, this is not a second. Committee, I'm reading that as a health and safety issue. Of course, this is the second committee meeting that, that we've had that we have raised. This is an issue in relation to particularly audit yeah, of personal matters. Yeah. So, um, if members are members content with yes. the forward program, okay, thank you very much. And any other business? Have members anything else they wish to raise at this stage? No, nothing to discuss. Um, our next meeting will take place at 10 a.m. on Wednesday, the 12th of February, 2020, in the Senate Chamber, Parliament Buildings. Thank you. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.